see my screen share so we can find the book. Here. I'll pull that out of the way. All right. Yeah, I tried to make it, was it last week? But I was about 20 minutes late. How did it go? I, I wait 10 or 15 minutes. If after 10 or 15 minutes, no one shows up, then I'm mm -hmm. on. I figured, you know what? Cause then at least we'll all stay, the majority of us will still be on the same page. Like right now we're on, cause no one showed up last Tuesday. We're still on page 101. Hey, is that Christina on the bottom right? <laughs> it actually kind of looks a little bit like her, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, has similar similar eyes. Oh man, they've got my transformation lines. Yeah, you see that the uh, definitely yeah. long transformation line. So it was a long transformation, and um, you know this area of the head reflects uh, basically from teens to basically to thirty. Once you hit the brows, and you hit the thirties. So yeah, that's a long transformation line. A little bit of skepticism line here coming out of that transformation, see? Yeah. Very interesting. But they're talking about the diagonal line on this man's forehead shows he's undergone a prolonged period of suffering and came out the other side with wisdom and an expanded consciousness. Exactly. I never had those until about a year or so ago. And now I woke up the other day and they were clear up like this on me. Well, you, my friend, have undergone a prolonged period of suffering and you came out the other side with wisdom and expanded consciousness. It sounds like just like the book said. <laughs> that that uh, I think when we go through experiences of being husbands and was wives and, you know, you start to connect the dots. You can't connect the dots moving forward. You can only connect the dots looking at the rear view mirror and you can look at where you've been. And as you start to pay attention to how you zigged and zagged, because nobody has a straight line, you know, so we all have to zigzag our way, you know, to success and to move forward. You can kind of connect the dots and go, oh, you know, now that I think about this and I look at this from this place, you know, in time and space, you can kind of analyze what you went through and, and you start to have, you know, when you do take some time to reflect, thank goodness yeah. for, uh, you know, we're very fortunate in the fact that we're, we've been clinically trained to do hypnosis and all this different regression technology. And we have so many tools at our disposition that we can do this on ourselves, by ourselves, or, you know, if, if we don't feel that we're making the progress that we really uh, would like, and we really think that we need somebody outside of us, then we can obviously call any one of our colleagues to, um, you know, do a one-on-one -on, -one on each other. But it's when you start to look at some of those things, and now you don't, you've been able to diffuse that emotional charge, or if maybe sometimes, you know, it's maybe just a lessened emotional charge. Maybe it's not completely out, but from this side of where you're standing, you're like, oh, okay, now I start to look at these things. And as the energy and the light is shed on that thing, um, you digest those emotions. And then you sometimes have memories that you, you're like, oh, wait a minute. That's right. When this happened, I forgot about that. And you have certain realizations. Like yeah. I had a, like, for example, and I'll just tell my, my own personal story because I think that that kind of helps, helps you and whoever in our, you know, of our colleagues who watches this later, it might help them as well. Because I know that when other people share their experiences, that's kind of what helps me as well. And uh, when my boyfriend and I first broke up, this was March of 2019, um, he, it, it was a very unexpected thing. I was literally editing some video. And I was, you know, at my desk editing some video. And then he was at uh, another table, you know, on his computer and his laptop. And he was, you know, editing or doing whatever he was doing. And then all of a sudden he just had this emotional outburst. And he, he basically started fighting with me and blaming me for something like on, under his website where I don't have any access to change anything on his website. But under his website, it showed his mentor and then it showed my, the radio show that I had, the bottom line show live, and it was showing under his website. So obviously he must've put that there. Cause I didn't, I didn't put that under his, under his company. 
but he burst it out. It's like, oh, you know, how is it that, you know, Dr. You know, Dr. Chu and you are on here and, um, you know, everybody's making money except me in this deal. And it was, it was something that was so, so preposterous and out of the blue and made no sense. And um, basically he was picking a fight with me for, you know, no apparent reason. And, and, and then he got really ugly and verbally abusive and um, he didn't physically touch me, but he got very, very emotionally abusive and said things that just more than crossed the line and things became crystal clear. And then, um, and I told him to get out. I knew it was done. It was over with. He crossed the line. I'm like, I said, get out, get out of my house. You got to leave. And so in my, in my, uh, from, from that moment, I felt that because he picked the fight that he broke up with me. Now, as I have been able to digest all these emotions and reflect back on that and unpack that, um, I realized he didn't break up with me. He instigated a fight. Um, he must have known that instigating that fight would cause a breakup. I think that maybe at a conscious level, he may have not realized that, but at a subconscious level, he must have known that that was going to, you know, incite a breakup. I think it was a form of self-sabotage. But um, in my mind's eye, I was thinking that he broke up with me because he started the fight. But the reality was, I was the one who said, it's done, it's over, get out of my house. So really, I broke up with him, even though he started it. And at the same time, I could also look at it that we both broke up with each other because I said, that's it, we're done, get out. And he said, okay, I'm out of here. And then, yeah, you know, you know, we went our separate ways. And so, but for months, I was saying that he broke up with me when in reality, that's not a hundred percent true. Cause I was the one who tossed him out. I said, Into the curb. yeah, I, you know, I wasn't, it was such a breach. There was so much disrespect. Um, you know, he threatened to sue me. And just all sorts of ugly stuff came out. And I thought, wow, this is, I've, you know, and I've been married for over 20 years with my first husband, my, the only husband I've ever had. I only had, you know, one marriage. I first and only boyfriend, you know, cause I married my college sweetheart. So this is my second relationship. And now I have this guy with this emotional outburst after two years of being together, never had an altercation we always had a lot of respect for each other. So for him to just have this over the top crazy reaction, which I thought was highly immature, lack of impulse control, uh, so many other things. I just, this was, that's a deal breaker. Nobody, it's like, no, you know, you don't have a, I go, no wonder he's been married twice and divorced. No, no wonder he's got all of these broken relationships in the past. I thought that, you know, maybe with us, it would be different because I thought perhaps it was really true love, but obviously it wasn't. And so as I reframed and looked back and as I healed myself from that, I realized, wait a minute, he didn't really break up with me. I'm the one who actually tossed him out. I'm the one who broke up with him. The bottom line is that we broke up. doesn't matter. He broke up with me. I broke up with him. It's really makes no difference. The point is that there was a breakup. That's actually the biggest. And the fact that there was that, that altercation and that, um, it wasn't done in a, in a healthy manner. There was no, there was no ability on his side to want to work towards um, a healthy conflict resolution. It was, it was all explosive because he comes from a family where that's how his mother was, that's how his sister was. They have a lot of physical and emotional abuse on that side, you know, on his side of the family. My family, we don't, we don't do that. You know, there's, there's been obviously issues of, I would say, my dad had a very physically abusive father for like 14 years. And then he healed of his drinking, his gambling, his smoking addiction when he was 44. And so for the rest of my dad's teenage years and grown up years, and that was gone. He went from having a father who was a monster to a father who was an absolute lamb that was laughing, joking, calm, never had a fit of anger or rage. 
after after it was literally one moment in time where you know he went from being very wealthy to losing three stores three homes almost losing his wife and kids to alcohol smoking and gambling and fits of anger and rage to all of a sudden he literally had to come to jesus moment surrendered it all and then it was like he was he went from Dr. Jekyll to Dr. Hyde. He never went back to being a monster again. Never mm. had another fit of anger. Never had another rage. Never had another. Never had another cigar. Never gambled again. Never smoked again. Never had any more alcohol. And in fact, a year later, he was back on his feet. And then I, we don't. My once he passed away, my father discovered that they don't know when how he was able to pull this off. But he was, um, apparently he went to NYU um, and got a degree. We thought he only had an eighth grade education. And when he passed away, they found his diploma. He had actually gone to NYU and gotten his bachelor's. Wow. And, you know, that was kind of crazy because they all, he was always a very smart man, but um, we always assumed that grandma and grandpa, that, you know, that they both were just, they both had eighth grade educations and that was it. But somewhere, somehow, after he got back on his feet again, he was working and he found a way to, I guess, go to school part time and he got his degree, but he never told anybody. Wow. And then, and then the rumors in New York was that, oh, Adolfo, maybe he didn't go bankrupt because when he lost everything, my dad and his older twin brothers and sisters, they all had to go to work, leave high school to help keep the family afloat. Hmm. And a year later, he was back on his feet and then he had a really nice large apartment in, in New York. So then people were like, wait a minute, we thought he went bankrupt. He must have not gone bankrupt. Well, he did go bankrupt. You know, he lost those houses, he lost those businesses. But um, so the point is, you know, you, you can recover. I know that's the exception, it's not the norm. But the person has to want to make the change. And I think if you're right. in a relationship with another human being, I think there's, um, I was just thinking about this today. I've done some videos on this and I ha and I really thought a lot about um, kind of diving more deeply into this because um, there's a, a concept that back in 2000, I'd say 2013 and 2014, this was, I had already started my divorce and something that I was able to articulate with my best friend was that um, like her and I, when we met, we were at USC, we were both college freshmen, we were 18. So I actually met her a year before I met my husband and we, we all went to USC together. And one of the things that uh, we have discussed over the years, because her and I are completely different people, <laughs> you know, from who we were when we met when we were 18 years old, but we've grown together. And one of the things that we, you know, I was able to language and I thought, you know, someday maybe I'll teach a course on this, but I've always thought inside a relationship, I know that this is, it's possible in a plutonic relationship where you have, let's say in my case, I'm a girl and my best friend's a girl, but I know that in a romantic relationship, it would be possible to also set this up, even though we didn't set it up intentionally, it was something that inherently was distilled and came out in our friendship over time and it was the concept of having unconditional love with unconditional communication and unconditional truth where there's no rights, no wrongs, no taboos, no judgment, no criticism, no blame. There's just this safe space. It's like this spherical bubble of energy between myself and another person where we can pr pretty much show up as we truly are without fear of being judged, criticized, or thought ill of, or be, be, being thrown under the bus, or something in our past being thrown back in our face. It's basically a safe place where we just openly listen to each other, and we're there to have compassion for each other, and know that, you know, there is no ill will. It's only about being there for each other, because we legitimately have a love and a friendship, you know, with each other. And I think that that's something that is not just something that's true in a plutonic sense, but I know that that's something I think between a man and a woman, if you come together and you have that agreement, it's like, okay, maybe we've never outside of this relationship, you haven't had that language or you haven't thought of it this way, 
but I know that it is possible to have between, you know, a romantic partner. And as long as you guys keep on affirming to each other, it's like, look, you know, this is a place, this is a safe place for us to come together with unconditional love, unconditional communication, unconditional truth, no rights, no wrongs, no taboos, no criticism, no blame. It's just a safe place to basically you're able to be vulnerable and open. And it's like, look at things from a different perspective perspective, and just offer compassion to the other person. Because oftentimes you, the only thing that the other person needs is to be seen, to be heard, and to be acknowledged. And sometimes by just getting that out and digesting whatever that energy and that emotion is, and now you get it out into 3D, then it dissipates, it digests, and just the fact that you were seen, you were, you were heard, and you were acknowledged changes everything. And if, um, if you can do that, I think, in a, in a relationship for each other, not just, not just one way, you know, it can, I think it's equally important for a, a woman to have a man that will create that safe space so that it doesn't matter what she says, provided that she's not, I don't think it, it's ever okay for a woman to be attacking a man. It's like, you know, trying to change him by making him feel bad or criticizing him. That's not what this is about. This is about, you know, basically you have to be responsible and manage your own stuff and say, okay, this is what I'm feeling. I'm not blaming you. You don't have to fix it. Let me just, this is what I'm going through right now. And I know that there, there are probably triggers or issues that are unresolved from when I was a kid that I'm not exactly pinpointing exactly what the source is, but I know that there's something there and I just need to have a safe place to, to be embraced, you know, and then vice versa. I think that's a very powerful place because there's really, there really isn't any other place for you to go. You know, oftentimes you can't even, you can't do that with your parents because oftentimes your parents or your siblings were the ones that were part of the creating of whatever trigger mechanism or inner child wound that, you know, they may have innocently done things because they didn't know any better or it's just a matter of how you took it in the moment. They may have not even done anything abusive. It's just how, as a child, how you experienced that. So now as a grown up, it's not your mom's responsibility or your dad's or your siblings. It's, it's our own responsibility to say, okay, it's not cool for me to project this onto my partner either. So now it's just a matter of, of um, cultivating this. And it's like, yeah, there's going to be things that are uncomfortable and that's okay. It's like, we have to feel, we have to learn to be uncomfortable with that tension, but the more we can assure the other person that this is a safe place and they reciprocate the same thing, they can mirror that back to you. I think that that's a really powerful place, but oftentimes couples, one might be willing to do that. And the other is like, Oh, that's too scary. Hell no. I'm out of here. You know? And if that's the case, then no. you have your answer and you know that this is not an equal give and take. So you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I wish I would have known. I wish I would have known. Uh, I mean, we all, it's, as we know better, as we grow, as we experience, then we can, you know, we're able to clearly define and figure out some of these things. Um, and I think that, um, and then, you know, that's, uh, the, if you look at the scriptures, the scriptures talk about as iron sharpens iron, so is one man to another. And of course, the scriptures always refers to men because the vernacular in that time was always referring men is supposed to really infer humanity. It's not just yeah, it's mankind. Yeah. So, so, but basically it's what it's saying is like that, you know, you can't do this alone. You basically need another human being with which to do this with. And our friends, the closest people, the people that are closest to us, they are there to, to be that iron that will sharpen the iron. You do that for each other equally so that we keep each other in line and keep ourselves so that we can be the best version of ourselves. Cause without that, we sometimes get out of our lane and sometimes we lose our way. But if we are willing to be that for others and others be that for us, then you know, together we can all grow. 
And so there's a lot of beauty in that, I think. Yeah. So, well, I don't know if anybody else is gonna join in. I know somebody last week, I think, tried joining in at 40 minutes past, but if you want, we'll go ahead and, um, do you wanna go ahead and read figure 227, the open third eye? which we can see here. In this yeah, section. I was looking at that, but it didn't make sense because it says the subject in the first photo has an open third eye that is see. in the indentation in this area. Can you see that? He has an indentation where it goes down like a valley. Do you see that? Like it's an oval shaped. Yeah, and I'm going, I don't know if I've got the indentation as much as the brows that stick out further. Um, you know what I've noticed? Some people have it as an indentation, and other people, it's lighter. The, um, that actual area of the face, you'll notice that sometimes it's lighter colored than the rest of the, um, than the, rest of the forehead. So, yeah, actually in the second one, it says here, the second subject's third eye is shown by the lightness in this area. So she, you could see how her, see how it's darker here? Yeah. But in the middle. See, but when it said lightness, it's that upper left in her forehead. That, yeah, because the light's shining up here. And she there, but the, right yeah, the other one right there. But she has a lightness, like you could see, it's dark till like here, it kind of comes to a point. And here, she does have a lighter area here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. It's like, okay, now do you see anything? Yeah, so let me, let me make my screen bigger here. Well, it's funny looking at that one, it almost looks like it goes, there's a line that goes all the way across. Especially if I raise up, then they go. Hmm. Let me... I'm trying to see how do I get my, um, hold on. Let's see if I can get the zoom to make the screen bigger so I can see you bigger. I'm gonna do the stop screen share. Okay, so now, I, let me take a closer look to, oh yeah, you definitely have it. Yours is actually indented and it's both. It goes down. So I don't know if you could see my, um, I'll do a screen share. Um, or actually, I think I don't need to do, can you see my cursor on the screen? Yeah. Okay. So like, if you look on yours, you can actually see how it goes down and back mm -hmm. up and it's lighter than this side and on this side. Yeah. It's lighter here to about here. So yeah, it definitely goes down and up. So you have both the lighter colored skin, definitely lighter. And it's and it indents down and goes back up again. So you have both. So your third eye is open for sure. You got them both. All right, I should be a healer. You are a healer. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you are definitely a healer. Okay, I don't know if you can see with mine. I had to make my. Um, you know, instead of the small gallery view, I had to make the whole screen so I could see your face read you. Oh, wow, now I am full screen. Okay. It's kind of interesting because so I'll be talking to people and nothing, and then all of a sudden I'm going, hang on, what can I pick up in them? Yeah, what you can pick up on their face. It's amazing what you can pick up, um, sometimes with girls because of our hair, Sometimes it'll cover up their temples because sometimes you can see how the temples will be lighter or sometimes they're kind of purplish color. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, Dr. David said that people who um, have a purplish color, usually they like to have out-of-body experiences due to, um, you know, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs. It's like they're- well, I thought it was when it was dented in, which- Yeah. It was dented in. Well, it's dented in, but if it's colored if, if it's light colored as opposed to if it's um, like a purplish. There you see the dent. Yeah, so like you're, you have the indentation, but it's light colored. So that means that you like to do out of body experiences, but as a result of meditation and those and hypnosis, not necessarily reaching for alcohol or drugs per se. If somebody uh, never, never got into drugs, but I wasn't alcohol big time. 
Yeah, but apparently you were. It doesn't appear, according to this, it doesn't look like you are any longer. I mean, your eyebrows suggest that you have a high tolerance like for alcohol because you've got thick brows, which also- That's why not. Nadine wanted to go out partying with me. Yeah, so you have obviously good testosterone levels and then you also have a good tolerance for, you can hold your liquor and you don't have um, kidney issues like under your eyes, your kidneys are, are working pretty well. So no, it's the adrenals that are shot. Yeah, a little bit of a, a little, you have a little adrenal thing kind of uh, playing around, not too bad, but you got some adrenals that are kind of going, hey, you know, pay attention. <laughs> but um, yeah, but it's light, it's not dark here. Sometimes, like you'll be out in public and you see some of them have it really dark. Really dark. Yeah, well, really here, dark. let me see if I can do this. That just made me green. Yeah, it's because of the type of light. Yeah, you know what? If you have, um, if you want to get a paper towel and put a paper towel um, over that light, then it'll soften it. Or even a Kleenex. Oh, yeah, much much better. Yeah, so I can see better. So yeah, I could see some of your frustration lines uh, between your brows, but you have a tolerance for having a lot of friends. You've got your little bit of sadness, obviously, on either side, next to your joy lines, pretty good joy lines. You've got multiple completed life lessons there in your 20s. If they'll show up, now they aren't really showing up. Yeah, your, um, yeah, your, got... yeah, your joy lines show up, your, your, um, some of your sadness lines show up too. Your, um, yeah, but like I said here, it's like your there the fact that it goes down there in your temple, it's light, it's not dark. You have a few little liver spots here and there, which is probably from drinking in the past. Um, yeah, your purpose lines are pretty strong, so it means that you're on par with what you should be doing. You got a little circulation issue, it looks like on your earlobe here, your right ear. Well, they're both ears and there's the line on them for the elevated. Yeah, so you might have, elevated, irregular is what it says. So, so do you have um, a regular blood pressure or do you have circulation issues? Circulation in the feet. Circulation in the feet, okay. Circulation, so you know what? It would probably behoove you to have um, beet juice. Did you know that beet juice is excellent for your circulation? Mm -mm. From blood pressure? You can get that like at mother's market, sprouts. Whole Foods, just pure beet juice. They have um, this. I like beetology, and uh, you got beet, lemon, and ginger. Sometimes they have it with raspberry or cherry. Well, that's the next one is how nasty is it? No, it tastes really good actually. It tastes really, really good actually. So it doesn't. I mean, regular beet juice tastes okay, but because they mix this with ginger and with lemon and or cherries, it's actually pretty fantastic. You'll it's a great drink. It really is. Um, let me see what else I see with your, um, let me see your ear, your right ear. Let's see, that was the right ear. Yeah, so this is seven to 14. Here, let me soften it. So, So 11, 12 years of age, it kind of thins here a little bit. So I don't know if there's a little bend here around the 11, 11 year mark. Did anything happen in your life when you were 11, 12 years old approximately? 10, 11, 12? And my brother was born. Oh, okay. So, you know, that's probably why you have that a little bit of that bend. We already talked about the um, circulation there. Oh. You have those intuition, auditory intuition, very, very strong in front of your ears here. So did um, you have a lot of yelling parents growing up? No. You didn't have any yelling parents? Did you have any kind of a, uh, was there any kind of, yeah, because you have a very strong auditory intuition. Did you have any kind of, um, did you have an abusive older sibling or any? Uh, I was the older sibling that was abusive. Okay. You didn't have anybody else that was hot tempered around you or uh, uh, some like unexpected, unpleasant surprises that repeatedly showed up? Not repeatedly. No, mom, mom and dad were really fairly, fairly mellow. 
And it wasn't unless something really big happened. That was the only time dad stepped up. It's like, okay. Okay. Yeah, you've got, um, well, you have, it could be maybe inherited then because you have very strong auditory, auditory intuition. That means that you have amazing bullshit detectors. You can tell pe people who are bullshitting in a heartbeat because, you know, you just know if it resonates true or not, whether they're speaking the truth or not. You can pick up your BS meter is like highly calibrated. Yeah, and I need to be more in tune with that instead of just like, yeah, whatever, and let everybody walk all over me. Yeah, so pay attention to that because you'll you'll get an intuitive hit. One thing that um, over the years that I've learned about intuition, mm -hmm. um, so you're going to hear things that people will say, and then when you hear something, pay attention to what your body is feeling because you might get a little itch in your nose or you might find yourself right after you hear something, you might go like this to your nose or you might go like this or you might feel a twitch in your eye or you might feel, you might even feel like a little like prick or a tingling sensation in your big toe. You might, or you might just have a, like a pang in your stomach, like a gut feeling, literally a gut feeling where you might have a piercing feeling or like a nauseating feeling, some sort of body sensation. Hmm. Um, it's, it's different for, for everyone. You might, um, you know, for some people, all of a sudden the taste in their mouth will go sour, something along those lines. But it's some sort of sensory feeling where all of a sudden you might find yourself like hearing something and all of a sudden you might sneeze too, even though you don't have any allergen or any cause to make you sneeze, you might sneeze two, three, four, five, six times in a row. Wow. Okay. Um, so it could be a sneeze. It could be, even though you're well rested, all of a sudden you're like a big yawn. Most people think that a yawn is suggestive of you being bored or tired and it's not. Biophysically, when you yawn, it's an energy shift in the body. So a yawn could be signaling an energy shift, which is saying, okay, yeah, you picked up something with your auditory sensations. And so now your energy is shifting inside of your body and manifesting as a yawn. So that makes you pay attention to what the person is saying. And you might say, I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Did you say such and such? Would you say that again? Or I, didn't, I don't think I heard you clearly. Would you repeat yourself? And then ask them to repeat themselves and then you'll go, oh, okay, and then I gotta pay attention to this because you picked up something and you had that physical manifestation that's giving you, a, it's basically a red flag saying, pay attention to this. Either this is, either it's BS or it could be something that is a special message that they may not even know that the message is for you, but it's a special message for you. Hmm. Uh, only you can decipher which is it? Yeah. That's really cool. Dr. David has those too. Um, well, I think it's neat because there have been certain things where people pointed out, oh, you've got this, you've got that. And I go, I do. And I've almost felt like, well, then if I've got it, maybe I should explore it or exploit it. Absolutely. More. Yeah. As you pay more attention to it, Mm -hmm. and you start um, testing it, you're going to go, oh my gosh, this is, you're going to be surprised at how spot on you are. And then you're going to start to recognize, like I had a lady, this is years ago, I had a lady who every time she would get um, intuitive, she called it an, intu an intuitive click, was she, her big left toe always tingled every time. If it was something, especially if she was talking to somebody about something spiritual, uh -huh. and a high resonance with her and that other person, her big left toe would always tingle. And I'm like, how peculiar. She actually felt like a tingling sensation in her big left toe. Yeah. So it, it, there's no limit. You know, you might feel maybe your eye always, you know, it's always your left eye might, might um, either twitch or itch or something, but you'll, it'll be some sort of physical manifestation and you'll go okay this is out of the ordinary then you know so you have to just pay attention to your own body and then you start realizing 100 percent of the time every time i test this i 
hear something, I have this sensation, and then sure enough, if you ask, you might have a stranger. I told you the story about the lady at the, at the, at the post office, right? Noelle? No. I didn't tell you? Okay, maybe, there's, maybe this was a YouTube video that I did then. Um, I, thought I, I thought I mentioned on a Chinese face reading. So when I was testing my um, hearing God perfectly well, listening to my intuition, um, it was uh, close to seven o'clock at night. It was like December and I was about to start making dinner and I had a piece of mail that I needed to, to put in the mailbox. And just as I was getting ready to, to start preparing dinner to cook, I had this overwhelming urge to put that in the mail. And that meant that I was going to have to get in my car, drive to the post office like two miles away, and then come back and do dinner. And I'm like, no, 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 no. My left brain is going, no, 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 no. I'll just do this after dinner. And then I went to start dinner, and it was like this overwhelming urge, almost like the urge to go pee. You have to do it now. Mm -hmm. That and I'm like, ah, fine. It's like whatever. So I grabbed the piece of mail, grabbed my purse, jumped in my car, drove two miles, went to the post office. As I walked into the post office, I noticed that there was this lady to the left hand side, and I was, you know, kind of walking hurriedly because I needed to get back to make dinner for my family. So I'm walking hurriedly, and as I noticed her, I thought with with my mind, I thought, oh, that's a homeless lady. And as I took a few more steps, I heard, no, she's not. And it made me sit up and I said, she's not. And I heard, no, she's not. She just lost her home. So I said, she just lost her home. So I said, okay. So I took a few more steps. I put the envelope in the mailbox. I turned around. As I walked back, I'm looking at her. And I'm like, I thought she was a homeless lady. It's like, nope, she just lost her home. So I said, I got to ask her, you know, what do I care what she thinks? I need to verify that I'm hearing you know, clearly, right? So I walked up to her and I said, excuse me. I said, by chance, did you just lose your home? And then her eyes got as big, you know, wide as saucers. And she said, yes. She goes, how did you know? And then I just smiled because I'm like, I got confirmation that I'm like spot on, right? So I said, oh, it doesn't matter. And you know what? If I told you, you wouldn't even believe me. So it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. But thank you for confirming. She was like, no, no, no. And then she put her hand on on this arm, on my forearm. And she said, no, 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 you need to tell me. Um, how do, how did you know? Well, I knew that I couldn't tell her that I thought she was homeless because I didn't want to offend her. Right. But I, so I just told her, I said, okay. Um, I go, honestly, you're not going to believe what I tell you. So it doesn't matter. I just heard that you were, that you lost your home. She goes, tell me how you know. Where I come from, we believe in things like this. Hmm. I said, okay, so what's your name? And she says, her name is Noel. And I said, of course it's Noel, second sign. I said, of course your name is Noel. It's December. And, and I immediately thought, because I, I speak French too, so I thought, of course it's Noel. Noel, joyeux Noel. That means joyous. Uh, Christmas. Noel is the French word for Christmas. And we're in December, two weeks before Christmas. So I'm like, of course, your name is Noel, as I'm getting this confirmation. So I said, okay, um, your name is Noel. Of course it is. How perfect can that be? So I'm going, ha ha ha. It's like, okay, I know what you're doing here. So as in God, not as in her. So I said, listen, Noel, um, I hear things on a need to know basis. And so sometimes Jesus tells me things on a need to know basis. She goes, Jesus, Jesus, who is this Jesus? I said, you've never heard of Jesus. She goes, no, who is this Jesus guy? I need to know more about this Jesus guy. Where can I learn more about this Jesus guy? I said, you've never heard of Jesus. She's like, no. I'm like, oh my gosh. I go, how could she, you know, we live in Huntington Beach. This is like a, over 205,000 people in Huntington Beach. We're a large city, you know, in the U.S. How could she not know who Jesus is? And I'm like, I'm like, okay. So I pull out a piece of paper. I give her um, name, address. I go, listen, 
every Sunday, three times at 8, 9 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. There's a group of people here that meet together. You don't need to bring any money. It doesn't matter how you're dressed. You can learn as little or as much as you'd like. There's no requirements of, of you. You can engage with the other people as little or as much as you want, but it's a place where everybody gets together there to learn about Jesus. So um, you'll find me there sometimes. Sometimes, you know, I'll be there at the first, the second, or the third gathering. Doesn't matter. But if you're serious about wanting to learn more about him, that's a great place to start. And then that was it. So then as I left, I thought, okay, now I understand why I had that urge where it couldn't wait. Because I would not have met that lady had I gone later. And that right. was, and because I was willing to be self-effacing, I didn't care if she, if I looked silly or dumb or anything, I needed to know for myself that what I was hearing was in fact accurate. I was willing to ask her. I, that was my first confirmation. And then my second confirmation was hearing what her name was. And then, you know, the rest is history. So it, that, you know, that was one of the ways I tested. I, I tested people in the bank line where I had somebody behind me at the time it was Bank of America and there was a guy behind me and I, I'm like, okay, I didn't know why I was getting this intuitive hit about this guy. So I turned around and I, I asked him, you know, basically I did the same thing. I, in that particular case, I didn't ask him his name. I just said something to him and then his eyes got as wide as saucers too. And I said, okay, I'm like, obviously I'm hearing pretty clearly. So you learn to distinguish uh, what you're hearing or sometimes it's not a word per se, but it's like a feeling and you can interpret, give words to that feeling, but, but you know what it means to you. And then you can confirm again, they're, they're, people are strangers. You have nothing to lose. Nothing. The worst that can happen is that they say no and you're like, and then you're going to get to the point where people may say no and you're going to know when they're lying because some people will be too embarrassed to, to admit to whatever it is. So, but that comes after you, you know, I think fine tune this more and you trust yourself more. And then you're, you know, especially you, cause you have the auditory intuition. I don't have, I don't believe I have the auditory intuition lines, but you have those strong auditory intuition lines. So for you, maybe the process will be even faster. But, you know, it's, uh, it's like calibration. And then there's going to come a point where you don't really need to test as much anymore because you're just going to know that you know that you know. And you'll be more spot on. But then other layers will be made um, just like anything. You know, that ability will grow where other things will be revealed to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. And the face reading, it's really kind of ha handy because you can see things on people's faces. And then as you... As you hear what people are saying, things, certain things will resonate with you. Other things you will, you will have that auditory intuition that will tell you yay or nay. And then you can confirm certain things with, you know, as you read people's faces, you can say, okay, I could see this. I could see that. You know, it's all up to you. Okay. So let's get back to the book. I'm going to change the screen sharing here let me, to the Let me grab a drink of water. This is out. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to pull up the book. Here we go. Okay, back to, back to my transformation arms. Yeah, so at the bottom of figure 227, it says that the second subject's third eye is shown by the lightness in this area, and this gives them both the ability to see into situations and other people's motivations. They are both healers and use this ability for diagnosis. Walking the shadow side of the moon implies that you are on a journey where the most important discovery along the way is that you learn about you. What's most interesting is that you often do not even realize you are coming out of it until you are all the way out. At some point, you start feeling better, but you don't pay much attention. Then sometime later, you realize that you've been doing, you've been doing well for a while, but it, does, it still doesn't seem like very long, and you don't trust it to last. Eventually, you realize that life is going really well and that you are actually happy and have been for a while, and only then do you realize that you are done. 
you have survived and can enjoy the good times again. And when the bad times come again, you have experience. And of course, you don't want to do it again, but you can and you will. And every time a bad time comes again, you are better at dealing with it because you will learn to have faith in your ability to cope. And eventually, it won't even be scary. It is just sending something you have to go through and you will not just survive. You will thrive as you enjoy gaining wisdom. You will have opened your third eye even more and have claimed a little more enlightenment as a reward. So the most important thing to realize about wrinkles is that they show what you have felt and what you are still feeling, whether you are expressing those emotions outwardly or not. While emotions are necessary for communication, practicing emotional management is important to maintain balance in life. In the past, stoicism was valued and people didn't express very much. These, pe these days, people may be expressing too much. Expressing emotions make people feel more alive and people enjoy being expressive. We have several successful <laughs> that are based on emotions, the entertainment industry and the pop psychology, self-help industries. And the problem is that expressing emotions is a valuable, is valuable when necessary, but constant drama is not good for your health. The Buddhists often talk of the middle way or moderation between extremes. Therefore, the right use of emotion involves expressing what needs to be expressed, but not too much and not too often. So, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Um, she, in her book and in the videos that I've watched where she's teaching, she doesn't talk too much. I mean, there are times where she does have distinctions about men and women, you know, like, you know, there's basically a mirror reflection down the middle of the face. It's the same age. Uh, numbers are the same in men and women. And then the right side is the equivalent left side and vice versa for men and women. Um, she doesn't talk too much about emotional expressions and the difference in terms of how your hormonal expression varies with men and women, because with uh, there's a study by Stanford Research Institute and also UCLA Medical School where they have all these studies in um, cultures throughout the world and even current um, Aboriginal tribes where they're still un, um, unaltered by you know the, the Western world and our way of thinking and socialization, right? But they talk about the difference between males and females and how throughout their lifespan, um, like men, typically if men express, like in order for men to keep their testosterone high, um, they can't be expressing too much of what they feel all the time because that increases their estrogen and lowers their testosterone. Conversely, one of the symptoms of a man who um, has low testosterone is a man who blows up, who doesn't have self-control, doesn't have discipline, doesn't have drive, doesn't have ambition. That's usually a man whose testosterone level is too low and his estrogen levels are too high. If a man has, you know, a man is um, in actively engaging in working, challenging, doing things that they don't necessarily want, but they're goal-oriented, fixing things, that automatically boosts their testosterone um, because of those behaviors, literally physically, biochemically, and neurochemically, increase your testosterone and lower your estrogen, which makes them very attractive to the female. The female, on the other hand, if the female is being too goal-driven, working too hard, doing things that she doesn't necessarily uh, like, maybe suppressing her, her desire to complain or desire to express her emotions. If she's stuffing down those emotions, that's going to increase her testosterone, lower her estrogen, which is going to repel her and not make her attractive to her mate. She, if she is in a work environment where she has to express that way, she needs mm -hmm. to know how to come back behaviorally at the end of the day and engage in activities that will lower her testosterone, increase her estrogen and progesterone, things like getting you know, manicures, pedicures, going shopping, getting together with a, a few girlfriends and chit-chatting, complaining about whatever her problems are at work, challenges that she might have at work, um, whatever issues and so forth that she just needs to unload emotionally or to come together with, with her mate or with her husband and he doesn't have to fix them necessarily, but if he's just there as a safe place 
and she can unload that for five or 10 minutes and he just is there to embrace her and make it safe. And then, then she can melt into that masculine energy. He's penetrating her energy field, increasing her estrogen and her oxytocin. And then when they come together um, in a more intimate setting, now they have the proper balance where his testosterone is 20 to 50 times higher than her testosterone. And so now their levels are, are set so that they have, um, they continue to have attraction for each other into their 70s, 80s, even 90s. Um, but that's something that we're culturally not really conditioned to know how to do because of the feminist movement. And, you know, we have all this weird gender kind of like neutrality uh, thing that's been going on for, I want to say the last 50 years. Um, in all sorts of different areas of our society, including fashion. Like recently, this last couple of years, it's like, and the um, like high fashion. They've got like clothes for men that looks like something out of Alice in Wonderland, where the guys look like they're dressed up like women, which is like, what kind of weird, sick? What the heck is going on here? I can't imagine any man in their right mind wearing these basic dresses that are like these Alice in Wonderland, kind of like Disneyland type of characters. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. It's kind of bizarre. It has gotten strange. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, interesting. Okay, so we're- what, pa what page are you on? We are on page 106. Okay. I wanted to go back and look at that a little bit later and be, be able to pull it out of the PDF. Yeah, 106. Okay, so we're on part two, the five elements of the face. So the number five represents the five senses, five elements, five colors, five tastes, and the five systems of the body. So when the heart is in harmony with the five senses, it is aware. This leads to realization. Ed Young, Voices of the Heart. This. The ancient Chinese, Chinese Use the system of the five elements to divide the world into vibrational families. They discovered that things with similar attributes could be grouped together into archetypal associations with the natural world. Water, wood, fire, earth, and metal, also known as air because of the hole in the Chinese coin. The five element system not only described the principal energies of each major grouping, it could also be broken down into smaller subsystems such as the seasons, taste, colors, shapes, sounds, activities, textures, etc. The five element theory involves both the generative and destructive cycles in figure 11-1. These elements can help and harm each other. The generative cycle occurs when water feeds wood, makes it grow. Wood becomes fuel for fire. Fire creates ash to feed the earth. The earth grows metal, which in turn melts and becomes water. The destructive cycle acts much the same way as the childhood game, rock, paper, scissors. Water puts out fire. Wood depletes the earth. Fire melts metal. Earth blocks water's flow and metal cuts wood. Another interesting fact is that the oppositions or excesses and deficiencies that they cause look very much alike, but the emotion or motivation underneath will tell you what is dominant. So, so we go here at the top of this graph, you have water and we're gonna go clockwise. Water, it says feeds wood, destroys fire. So if you wanna think of feed wood, like feeding a tree, the water, you water a tree and if that wood catches fire, the water will destroy the fire. And it says here black blue. If you go to the, the next one, it's wood. Wood helps fire, saps earth, and it's green. Then you go down to fire, produces earth, ash, melts metal, and it's red. And then to the left, earth creates metal, obstructs water, and it's yellow-brown. And then up to metal, produces water, chops wood, white metallic. So that's the five element creative and destructive cycles. So although these elements are easily balanced in the natural world, it becomes an art to balance them in our lives. 
These five elements are also represented within our bodies as the five major organs and their associated body parts, emotions, and actions. Look at table 11-1. Everyone has all five major organs. The kidneys associated with water, the liver, wood, the heart, fire, the spleen, stomach, earth, and the lungs, metal. These are essential organs, for if any of these organs fail, you can die without medical intervention because everyone has all five organs. We all have the five elements as part of us. The individual balance of these five elements depends on functioning and the predisposition of each organ and its strength or weakness along with overuse or underuse. So the five elements, the physical aspects, so if we go through this table across the top, you'll see the same thing that we have in the diagram here to the left, and it has blue water, green wood, red fire, brown earth, gray metal. And so you have the body parts, which we just read about, kidney, liver, heart, spleen, and lungs. And body type. So it's basically telling you if you're a water body type, you have shadowed eyes, big bones, wide hips. Okay, so apparently I'm not a water type. Correlating facial features, ears, forehead, chin. Your needs are being water, time alone, creativity. Colors are black and blue. Shape, amorphous curved additions. Seasons, winter, weather, cold, sound, moan, action, shivering, senses, hearing. So we're going to have to make, I'm sorry about hitting the microphone. I'm going to have to make more sense out of this uh, chart here in a bit. I'm going down the wood element. Says uh, the organ would be liver. Tendons, neck, and head are the part of the body that's influenced. So if you have a strong wood element, you are tendons, your neck and head are influenced, your body type is tall, sinewy, short, energetic. Oh, I might be wood then. I was going to say, so that's you. I was going to say, energetic. yeah, I'm short and energetic. I'm not tall and sinewy, but I'm short and energetic, so I guess I'm wood. Um, correlating facial features, eyebrows, brow bones, jaw. Um, yeah, and you're describing me as well. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like you too, because you're tall and sinewy. Uh, you definitely have the eyebrows, the brow. You have a big brow bone. You and the jaw. Yeah, straw jaw. Needs, doing, trees, plants, focus, intensity. Okay. Colors, all greens. Green happens to be my favorite color, so that's interesting. Shapes, tall columns, rectangles. That's funny because I love columns. Seasons, spring, weather, wind. I love the wind. Sound, shout. Action, clenched fist. Senses, seeing. Interesting. So the next one is fire. So the organ related to fire is the heart. That makes sense. Passion, body parts influenced hands, chest, and ribs, body type, small, narrow hips, redness, or flesh in the neck. Hmm. So maybe I'm wood fire because I'm small, narrow hipped. Red. And I'm redneck. So, okay, interesting. Correlating facial features, eyes, lines, tips, corners. I don't know what they mean by tips, corners, eyes. I wonder if it's tips, corners of the eyes. We'll, we'll have to read about this. It says here, needs playing, color, light, heat, talking. That sounds like me. Colors, red, pink, bright. Shapes, angles, sharpness, corners. Seasons, early summer. Weather, heat, sound, laughter. Oh, yeah. Action, anxious look. That's an action. Okay. Senses, feeling. Uh, for the earth, yeah, be one and then have other traits, kind of like when you're doing color code. Yeah, I think we all have all all five of them. It's like to what percentage you'll have one. You might have two dominants, 
but you'll usually have a predominant, like a first, a second, a third, fourth, fifth. It's like usually they're ranked just like any kind of personality profiling. This is, I think, uh, like a personality profiling, but kind of more comprehensive. That's not just personality. It's also your, your whatever your predispositions, your strengths and your weaknesses um, uh, from a comprehensive, holistic, um, full body, body, mind, and spirit type of um, perspective. So the earth element is your spleen and stomach is the organ, body part influence, pancreas, large muscles, mid back and abdomen, body type, rounded fleshy plumpness. I just thought of a few people I know. Correlating facial features, mouth, lower cheeks, above lips, needs, family, friends, comfort things. Colors, brown and yellow. Shapes, low, heavy, permanent, stable. Seasons, late summer. Weather, damp. Sound, singing. Action, spitting. I don't, I, that's interesting. Senses, tasting. Okay, metal. Lungs is the organ that's related to metal. Body parts that are influenced is skin, body hair, upper back shoulders, body type, small boned, fair skinned, aquiline features. That's very fine features. Correlating facial features, nose, cheekbones, moles. Needs, order, purity, boundaries, space and time. Well, I kind of sound metally too here. Uh, colors, white, pastels, metallic, shapes, round, square, open, seasons, fall, weather, dryness, sound, crying, weeping, action, cough, senses, smelling. So mm. it says here, even the face can be divided into groupings of five element features and their corresponding emotions. These features correlate directly to the organs within the body and indicate their health and functioning. Strength in certain features indicates strength in the related organ and the ability to express the primary emotion that the organ, that organs control, controls. Analyzing these features makes it easy to create a snapshot of the inherent personality of someone in an elemental profile. The traits associated with each feature are neither good nor bad. It only matters how they are used. Creating a comprehensive profile is also more important than focusing on the meaning of any individual trait. Very interesting. However, in analyzing the facial features, the parts must be broken down before the whole can be synthesized. So let's take a look at the five elements, starting with the water element from which all life comes. Okay, so hopefully this will give us more insight. This is the, when we took our face reading class, this was understanding these different elements were the hardest for me to. We uh, talked about them briefly and just, oh, you're this, you're this, you're this. And you're like, huh, how do I know? I, yeah, I didn't get it. The only one that resonated with me that I understood, I'm like, okay, metal, that's the analytical those are the ana analytical thinkers and, um, you know, critical thinking skills and so forth. So I got that one. The other ones, I was like totally lost. And I kind of had a notion that maybe fire were, were people that were more expressive, outgoing and passionate, but really the one that I understood, the only one that I really kind of understood was metal. Uh, and I'm like, okay, I don't really get this whole water, fire, da, 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 these five things. So hopefully this will clarify it here. So the water element is the most generative force in nature and is what drives the fundamental desire to procreate and create. This element symbolized by the seeds that sprout underground in the winter, patiently waiting for their time to emerge. Then water continues to feed these plants as they grow. Water carves the land with infinite tenacity and perseverance and gives it shape. It is strong, deep and mysterious and it is associated with darkness and the colors black and blue. Water is the giver of life on our planet. 
Although most of the Chinese medical texts focus on wood as the first element of the five element system, I was taught and have always believed that water was the starting place. We live our first nine and a half to 10 months in a gentle bath of amniotic fluid. And the spinal column and brain, which are associated with the kidneys, are the first organ to begin developing in utero, along with the skeletal structure. Hearing, which is associated with the kidneys, I never knew that hearing was associated with the kidneys. That's fascinating. Mm. Hearing, which is associated with the kidneys, is the first sense to be activated in the womb. Water is about being, allowing enough stillness to be, and the ability to to let come what will or to go with the flow. It's about getting ready for action. Our fundamental need for water is made evident in the makeup of the human body, which is composed of nearly 90% water. According to Chinese medicine, the water system of the body includes first the kidneys, then the brain, bones, bone marrow, spinal cord, reproductive organs, bladder, the lower back, hips, knees, teeth, hair on the head, and pubic area. The water system is responsible for the fundamental inherited Jing, which is the battery of the body and the inheritance from our ancestors. Overuse of this system causes aging, whereas wise use and care allows for regeneration. Many signs on the face indicate how strong the water element is how well the kidneys are currently functioning and the potential for longevity. So we're going to have to take a closer look at that. Emotionally, the water element is responsible for fear and the associated emotions of surprise, panic, and terror. Fear is a powerful and primal emotion that we are confronted with our entire lives. I'm sorry, fear is a, a powerful and primal emotion that we are confronted with our entire lives. It is the emotion that robs the kidneys of energy and depletes Jing when overused and causes dangerous recklessness when underused. And it corresponds to the action of courage. On the face, features associated with the water element can be evaluated for size and strength. The larger or stronger the feature is, the more physical or emotional water strength a person has. The feature that most clearly represents the water element, oh, is the ears. This is considered the vital element of the kidneys. Oh, so there's a tie between the kidneys and the size of your ears, I guess. And it, that corresponds directly with the amount of courage. So after that, you can evaluate the hairline, upper forehead, the under eye area, the groove or philtrum, and the chin. Each of these features shows either a strength or deficiency in the water element, and together they create a profile of how watery a person is. So look at this guy. He's got medium-sized ears. Uh, you see he's got a very well-defined philtrum. See how it's very very def there's a lot of definition from the mm -hmm. lower lip from under his nose to the bottom it goes from narrow so his energy is going from he had the least energy as a child as he grows into old age he's going to have continued energy into old age um, it's very you know, it has a deep groove see how it's got high peaks and a low valley hmm, very interesting so a water face. There is a stillness in this man's face along with the deep eyes, okay, that indicate that he has an abundance of water energy. In addition, the strong upper forehead, see how he has a very clearly defined third eye too. And yeah. the chin shows the dominance of his kidneys. I don't get the part of the chin showing dominance of his kidneys, but he does have a strong upper forehead. He's got that M forehead. He's got the open third eye. He's got a strong upper brow. He's got an extrapolative forehead. Um, it also shows, according to what we just read, because he's got medium size. I wouldn't say he has large ears, but he has medium size. So he, I, he has medium, medium courage. 
Um, apparently, he's a really good listener because see how close to his head his ears are? They're not mm -hmm. sticking out. So the fact that they're so close to his head means that he's a really good listener. Interesting, huh? Yeah. You'd think it was the other way around. The ears would stick out more so they could hear more things if yeah. they were going to listen. Yeah, it's opposite. Because I thought the same thing, too, when we were reading through the book. And, and, it talked, and he talked about it in class, too, how, like, the ears, I always thought that if you had ears more sticking out like that, that, that means that you're a really good listener because you're kind of, but no, the closer they are to your head, that means that you're really good at listening to details. You're a better listener than somebody whose ears that are sticking out. I think it's because they aren't good listeners. That's why the ear extends out. It's trying to reach and it's efforting more, whereas he doesn't have to effort to listen. It's more instinctive. That's why it's close to his head. Yeah. So the wood element. We are now. Let's learn about us, huh? Yeah. So now this is the wood element, page 112 of 438. The wood is the element of dynamic change and growth. Like the tree, it symbolizes the shoots of early spring. Wood rises upward from the ground and is the connection between earth and heaven. The wood element is forceful, strong, and direct. Trees give our plant the oxygen we need to breathe, the shade under which we find protection, and the materials with which to build our shelters. Wood created our first weapons and shields and is symbolized by the warrior. In Chinese medicine, the wood element is the season of spring and the color green all the shades of green found in the natural world, which symbolize the new life that emerges and bursts forth from the mysterious inner world to make a mark on the outer world. The wood element corresponds to the liver, oh, and is responsible for the emotion of anger and the action of drive. People with strong wood energy love a good fight. Oh, that's not true for me. I don't like a good fight. I don't like a good fight either. Yeah, I avoid it like the plate. I'm, <laughs> that's not, but that's what it says here. So it says they love a good fight. The element fuels people to give them the energy that helps them go out and conquer the world through work or war. Wood energy is responsible for the ability to push through obstacles and accomplish goals. It's about focus. The wood element is involved with doing and getting things done. I do like Gives me a lot of satisfaction to get a lot of stuff done. The wood element features show how, how strong the liver is and how well it is functioning as one of the most powerful internal detoxifiers. The wood system of the body correlates to the gallbladder, the neck and head, the tendons and ligaments, and the iris, the sexual organs, and the nails. The vital feature corresponding to the liver is the eyebrows. Yeah, when we, I've got the strong eyebrows and you have the strong full eyebrows too. Strong eyebrows show how much energy and passion a person has to challenge the world. After that, the brow bones. So the brow bones, I don't have a brow. I don't think my brow bone is, yeah, my brow bone. You have a very strong brow bone though. Mm -hmm. So the brow bones and then the temple area, the seat of the stamp, the set of the eyes, the sclera, the jaw can be evaluated for size and strength. Together, these features along with a green or olive cast to the skin, which I definitely have an olive cast to the skin, can be combined to show how woody someone is. Interesting. Yeah. So they're talking about this guy here. He has a wood face. This man's strong eye. Yeah, he's got, see, your eyebrows are like this guy's. It's the only difference is that his are white and yours are black. And his direct and focused gaze are strong clues of a wood personality and show his determination and drive that come from a strong liver. So, okay, so I know he's got those deeper inset eyes as well. It's interesting. He's got a lot of, as far as left and right, totally different. Yeah. When you're looking at him, his left eye is lower than his right eye. Oh, yeah. His personal, 
Yeah, his personal eye is lower. His higher, his uh, right eye is higher up. His, um, there's more folds. It's not necessarily covered, but he has more folds in his personal side than his private side. There seems to be, there's, there's something more muddled here. There's, see how, how clear this eye is? Yeah. There seems to be some sort of desire to, to, to either suppress or to, to hide or to, um, I wouldn't say necessarily. I would say he's trying to suppress. Well, not necessarily suppress because it shows. He's yeah. suppressed the, the, the public side because everything looks fine. Yeah, on the public side. You can see the, the lost love lines are heavier in that one as well. Yeah, but he does. Look at the purpose line. It's there on the left side, and I don't even see it on the right, even in the shadow. Yeah, so it's very clearly defined on his private, but on his public side, he doesn't really have a purpose. He's got great disappointment. Yeah. He's got that retirement line, which says he's overworking. He's, he needs to chill a little bit. Um, he's obviously has lost, he's got lost love. He has um, a little bit of grief lines that you can see. I wonder if we can make this bigger. Let me see. Yeah, it won't make me in the sharing. It won't let me make this picture bigger, but um, his philtrum isn't isn't as defined, and it seems to be more even. It's not narrow at the top. It's just kind of parallel from the top to the bottom. So he has even energy throughout his lifespan. He has, um, I think, a little inflammation, little kidney inflammation, um, little adrenal. His adrenals are a little fatigued, a little, little dried, dried up. Um, Although he doesn't have much redness around. Usually if you, when you have a lot of adrenal fatigue, you have like redness. Like sometimes you'll notice people, even younger people will have a lot of redness along the edge of the eye. But he's got some adrenal stuff going on, but so much red. Yeah, interesting. You can tell a lot. He's got those, he definitely has some completed life lessons, a little frustration. He's got that um, spleen. You see the spleen line? He's got a double line under his spleen here. Yeah. He's got medium ears. The earlobes are not, um, they're not attached at the bottom. They're clefted, so he could be... Uh, He's okay with being independent, you know, from his family. So, okay, fire element. So fire element is vibrant, magnetic, and live, alive. It stimulates the spirit and excites the mind with dancing flames. Fire is the primal element that lit up the darkness of night and protected us against the unknown. It kept away the wild animals and extended the hours we could stay awake. It was the element to make music by, to dance around, and to sleep near. It created a whole new way of eating, enabling foods to be cooked, and expanded the ability to explore the world to find new places to live. Fire can be out of control, as if, as with a raging wildfire, or tamed like a fireplace or candle. In either case, fire can mesmerize. Fire is the element of fun and play. It is adaptable and quick to change. Fire rules the heart and the emotion of excitement, usually mistranslated as joy. Excitement like fire is temporary and burns out as soon as it loses its source of fuel. Fire constantly seeks to fuel, seeks fuel to burn, just as people with strong fire energy seek new experiences or contacts. Fire is easily extinguished and easily rekindled as long as there are smoldering embers and fire people smolder well. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Fire is associated with early summer and the blooming of flowers. 
Fire is about performance, play, and living in Technicolor. The colors red, pink, and purple, and all bright colors show how the fire element attracts attention. The fire element rules the heart. The parts of the body that belong to the fire element include the small intestines, the arteries, the hands, the chest and ribs, and the tongue, and the blood. The vital feature is the eyes. Fire is responsible for the light in the eye, the shen. This brightness shows the workings of the spirit, the mind, and the subtle shifts of all momentary emotions. The heart is the emperor of the body and rules over the ability to express all of the other emotions. The fire element is seen in the tips and corners of every other feature and shows how we communicate with words and hands. All wrinkles and their associated past feelings are associated with fire, even when they are in a part of the face that corresponds to another organ. Fire controls the activity of the brain, the firing of neurons, and the imagination and ideas this creates. The ancient Chinese had a fear of fire because even though fire gives us the zest to enjoy life, it can also wear us out and burn us up. Fiery people, are, you know, fiery people are easy to spot. They have bright eyes, big smiles, freckles, redness in the skin, and especially in the neck and chest area. Sharpness in their features and usually lots of lines showing you how much they can express the zest for life. I immediately thought of certain people that I know of, and um, that's, uh, that's kind of funny. So here's a fire face, and she has a lot of freckles. That's interesting. So a fire face. The woman's charming smile and freckles are the biggest signs of her fun, fiery personality. The sharp corners of her eyebrows. Yeah, see how her eyebrows go up? That also shows that she's really good at decision making. Sharp corners of her eyebrows, her eyes, nose, and mouth. So sharp corners of her eyebrows, her eyes. So you see that she's really sharp. She so she's fiery with her words, very, she could be very sharp with her words. See that on both sides, how it's hooked? Yeah. Um, nose, I mean, she has a very chiseled nose, very pointy. And mouth, for me, the mouth, it's not so obvious that her fire personality, other than she has a very big, big smile mischievous look in her eyes yeah she has a lot of shun add fuel to the fire that comes from her heart interesting okay so the next one is the earth element so now we are on sorry about that we are on page 116. the earth element as an element is warm and nurturing Worshipped as a nurturing mother since the beginning of time, Earth is the ultimate parent, and all living things are her children. The Earth is comforting and calm, solid and stable. Earth stays much the same for centuries. It is the most constant element. Earth energy is grounding and stabilizing, and it is, it is associated with the season of late summer and harvest. It is reminiscent of the trees heavy with ripe fruit and the lazy hot days where life moves slowly. Earth is about family, community, and gathering. It is about eating now and gathering, collecting, holding, and storing for later, like the sticky juice of ripe fruit. People with earth energy are sentimental and stay attached to other people, things, and places. Earth is about savoring the sweetness of life and enjoying all the comforts and pleasures. This kind of sounds like me too. <laughs> but again, it sounds like we have all the elements. It's just to what, what's primary, yeah. secondary, third, you know, what in what rank and order. 
and Pam's the Earth. Very cool. Yeah. In Chinese medicine, the earth element is about ingestion and absorption. It allows people to take in foods and ideas. And the organ most closely associated with the earth is the steam, stomach, and the digestive system of the body. It is also responsible for the pancreas, the large muscle of the body on the upper arms and lower legs, the abdomen, the mid-back, and the lymph system and the diaphragm. Earth element problems in the body often involve taking in too much. Stagnation, the slowing down of chi, or the inability to ingest or digest ideas or food. Oh, interesting. The emotions of earth are worry and sympathy, which keep people feeling connected, but can also make them feel stuck and un unable to act or think clearly, especially on their own. Earth energy also allows people to work together. This is why earth people are so good at maintaining family ties and friendships and creating cooperative and collaborative work environments. You can see that with Pam with her, you see her, that great family picture that she has in her office. Um, it's on her website too. Oh, she has it, on, I haven't seen her website. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. yeah. I saw the website the other night and I went, um, no offense, but you really got screwed on that thing. She paid $4,700 for this website. Oh, wow. And I can say, well, it looks professional, but hardly any of the pictures are what pictures she needs to. I said, go start looking at other hypnotist site and steal all their ideas and then combine it into yours. And she says, well, I don't have $4,700 for him to redesign the website. So don't worry about it. We'll find somebody in India to do it. Oh, do it for the London dollar. Yeah, you can find one of like um, either a Fiverr or um, Upwork or something like that that will go in and the back end, you know, she can give a temporary password and then change the password so that they can upload and change. Because she basically has a whole site done. She just has to replace certain things and kind of, she just needs to revise it. That's all. So I'm, I'm curious. I'm, I'm going to check it out. I have her business card right here, so I'll have to check that out. Okay. So the earth's vital feature is the mouth and lips, but it is also associated with the bridge of the nose, the eyelids, and the lower cheeks. The earth element is responsible for all the warehouses or fleshy parts of the face and the ability to hold on to people, things, ideas, objects, and or money. People with strong earth energy features know how to relish the comforts of life and the pleasures of being human. Earth people usually have lovely color in their skin. They tend to smell sweet and have a softness to their features that show how earthy they are. Yeah, you can see that in the, um, you know, in uh, like the apples of um, Pam's face. She has nice um, apples, nice money bags. Um, that's very cool. Well, the other one has said their favorite colors are yet something like brown and yellow. Hers is yellow. Oh, perfect. Interesting. Very, very cool. Okay, so now the metal element. So we are on page 118 and we have a gal here. This is an earth face. So before we go on to the metal element, let's wrap up here with this earth face. The lovely softness of this woman's face along with her full mouth, which shows a lot of sensuality, indicates an earth personality. She also has pretty money bags in her cheeks and kind eyes showing the strength of the spleen stomach. So I guess right here, those are her money bags and kind eyes. She does have very kind, very soft eyes. Showing the strength of the spleen stomach. Okay, the metal element. So the metal element is the element that is cool, reflective, and unknowable. It can be a pure, rare, and refined substance like gold or a composite 
made up of other metals like brass. Like the sword, metal can be tempered and strong, and like jewelry, it can be delicate and beautiful. It is a substance found in a raw form, but is most valued when molded, shaped, and crafted onto something unique. Metal in Chinese medicine is a confusing element and is often given attributes that are less than flattering. The confusion lies in the dual nature of the element. The oldest symbol for metal was the Chinese coin. Not only did it contain two different types of colors of metal, it was also a solid round object with a square hole in the middle, indicating air. The duality of the metal element is part of its magic. Like a Zen koan, metal is a paradox and symbolizes everything and nothing, great wealth and utter simplicity, lofty ideals and pretty details. Metal values the glamour and graciousness of the past, yet values the technology of the future. The metal element is complicated, yet ultimately easy to understand. Metal is associated with the fall and the time when the world is retreating to essence in preparation for the winter. It is contraction and yet it can also be a time of expansion, seen in the last brief show of color in the leaves and therefore is involved with high contrast. It is the color white, which is the Chinese color for death, and also all metal tones such as silver, gold, copper, brass, and steel. It is the emotion of sorrow that turns to grief for what used to be or what could have been or what will never be. Metal is about striving for perfection and suffering when it is not achieved. People with a large amount of metal energy are very rare, aware of small problems delicate nuances and changes in mood, temperature, and sound, and light. The metal element is responsible for the lungs, which connect or protect an individual from the outside world. They are often more, much more comfortable being indoors in a clean, serene, and beautiful environment. The metal element represents boundaries and taking in or cutting off input. People with strong metal tend to have acute senses and need to have a lot more space and minimal sensory input in order to rest effectively. The metal element also controls the upper back, the shoulders, the colon, the sinuses, the bronchi, the mucous membranes, body hair, and the sense of smell. Metal people are quite prone to allergies when young and upper respiratory viruses, yet they can still have strong lungs. The vital feature is the nose and the corollary features are the underbrow area, the cheekbones and cheeks and the skin. Look for refined features and bone structure along aquiline or strong nose and a symmetrical face that has space between the features. So they'll probably have a larger um, seated stamp area. So look for refined features and the bone structure along aquiline or strong nose and a symmetrical face that has space between features, fairness and or thinness of skin are also good indicators of how sensitive and metallic someone is. So this gal has a metal face. See how she has a large area between her brows and her eyes, and it's not close together. So this woman has a very symmetrical face. True. Her eyes are of the same level, and pretty much the right side is pretty symmetrical, both sides. With an aquiline nose, very strong chiseled nose, delicate eyebrows, refined bone structure, but see how you can see the bone under her brows here? Oh, yeah. Cheeks defined. She has a pointier, um, very defined jaw. See, it's like boom, 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 boom. So all in the future. Do you see any joy lines on her? Um, yeah, she does have some joy lines on both sides. She doesn't have that many, she has a teeny bit of sadness, but more joy than 
just a hint of sadness lying. A little but, lost. But look at the sorrow on her lips. Why do you say she has sorrow on her lips? The right hand when it turns down. Oh, that's disappointment. Yeah, she has I thought that was sorrow when I was reading that. Yeah, the, the corners of the mouth here, the, the fact that they're turned down, that's sorrow. So she's had, uh, she, not sorrow, I'm sorry, disappointment. Well, that's disappointment. In fact, if you want, we can do before, let me, before I do that, what page is this? This is page 120. So, hey, why isn't it working? This isn't working very well on this PDF. is not taking me to the pages like it should. Yeah, somehow you jumped to page 162. Yeah, I, I was trying to get to page 118 because that's where we were at before. Well, the PDF is different even though it's showing you pages 118. That corresponds to the book, not to the PDF. Yeah, so I think that's what it is. So I just need to go I'm back. Scroll up. Quite a bit, like 40 pages. Okay. There. So. Okay, the five element personality quiz. Yeah, so to create a five element profile. The features on the face must be evaluated for size and strength. So if the majority of water features on the face are prominent or large, an individual has a lot of water energy. So I guess we have to wrap our brains around what those water elements are, because it says here, if the majority of water features on the face are prominent, if they either stick out or they're large, then an individual has a lot of water energy. This can be strength in the water element, either physically, emotionally, or both. This person's kidneys may be very healthy or there may be a lot of courage, stubbornness, or will present. If all water features are small, there is most likely a deficiency in the water element and probably more fear. Ah, so the size, so the bigger, the more emphasized the water uh, traits are going to be physically or emotionally. And the smaller they are, the less pronounced they're going to be, even though they might be um, a water element that we're looking at. Most important features must be examined as a group. So a person with a smaller feature in one elemental group has an intrinsic balance because of another feature has that strength. So this is true for all five element feature groups. Evaluate each feature of a group individually and then look at the entire set of features, determine the strength or the deficiency. The important thing is to look for each person's intrinsic balance. There may be lovely features, but no face is perfectly balanced. Each face has a unique story to tell about the person to whom it belongs. We'll first look at the emotional traits of the features that tell us about personality and later discuss the health indicators of the face. So for fun, 
you might want to take the five element personality quiz table 11-2 to see how your five element emotional profile turns out. This may be different to your physical profile and that's good. Remember, you can never be just one element. You contain all five elements all of the time and the balance, strength and deficiency of the organs, emotions, and preferences can change based on use, overuse, and life circumstances. So that'll be cool to take this five element personality quiz that's on page, uh, on this PDF, it's on page 120. Next page. So, oh, I see. So that would be cool. You know what, it would, I think um, it would be cool to, uh, let's see. I'm guessing you look down there and check off what you are. Yeah, so you would print this page and you would check off under each each category the the you know the things that describe you probably and then the one that has the most characteristics in each column you would be able to rank one, two, three, four, five in the order from the most to the least, and then look at your physical versus your emotional um, markers, and then from that you can kind of um, get a pro, you know, a, basically a personality profile and a overall profile. Uh, this would be, actually, this would probably be really great to use with, with our private clients. I'm going to start using this with my private clients. And make them fill it out. Yeah. Just have them fill it out. And then you can actually have them do it there. I would have them do it right there in live time. So it's not like they have to come back and it's like another to do. Just do it as part of your session. It's like, and you want, you don't want them to overthink it. Cause as you know, they, if they just go with what they instinctively think, you know, what their first impression is and just have them go with their first impression, just go through each one. And if, you know, whatever's a hell yeah or a hell no on each one, just go boom, boom, boom. Just mark the ones that are all the hell yeahs. If you're not sure, don't. If there's something's a hell yeah, then just mark it off and just have them go boom, boom, boom. Then you'll get a clear snapshot. If you give it to them and then have them come back, they might overthink it. They might want to you know, express one trait that might not legitimately be their trait, but they might want to be portraying. So you eliminate that by just having them right there on the fly. Okay, let's just go this real quick. And you can just ask them, are you calm? Are you solitary? Are you peaceful? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Don't know, you skip it. If it's yes, it's either a yes or a no. Don't know is, is the same thing as a no. When in doubt, don't. Does that make sense? I'm yeah. Not using that. Yeah, right. just I'm just, was just looking at it, checking it off. It's like, okay, I'm like six in water. And so far I'm like halfway through and I'm already three in wood. Yeah. So yeah, this would be fun to do. Um, what I can do is maybe you can print a copy yourself and I'll tell people to print. This is on page 122. So, I'd have to just pull it up and go do it. Yeah. So just print this out from page 122 and then we can go through and then share each other's and kind of, you know, uh, just kind of do a, a review. Oh, I, I read uh, Rainer Maria Rilke's book. That's funny that that's quoted in here. So what else does she say about here? So I'm going to reread this. The, for fun, you might want to take the five element personality quiz to see how your five element emotional profile turns out. This may be different to your physical profile and that's good. You, uh, remember, you can never be just one element. You contain all five elements all the time and the balance and the strength and deficiency of the organs, emotions and preferences can change based on use, overuse and life of circumstances. The facial mosaic, there are quantities of human beings, but there are many more faces for each person has several. Rainier Maria Rilke, Notebooks of Malty Lord Bridge. The face can be viewed as a mosaic of many pieces, many small pieces joined together to create a whole, which can then be divided back into components, parts for analysis. The whole, however, is always more than just the parts and is held together by the glue of the individual spirit that resides within. The face is both 
our mask to the outside world and the access to our inner selves, which clues with clues that are readily apparent if we just started noticing them. The primary way the Chinese divide the face is to look at the two halves. The classic Chinese division of 10,000 things begins with one divided into two. The yin and the yang of many things include the face is a natural division. The yin and the yang are interdependent polarities and neither exist without the other. There are many aspects of these two polarities. Yin embodies properties such as cold, feminine, and damp. Yang, hot, or yang encompasses hot, masculine, and dry. Box 3.1 lists examples of these functions of yin and yang. Yin and yang have the interesting ability to become the other at any time because each contains the seed of the other. The only problem is that there are actually two different yin-yang divisions of the face. So here we have a yin-yang stone face. After teaching at the TCM Congress in Rothenburg, Germany one year, I was walking back to my hotel room and was captivated by this yin-yang image in stone created by exposure to the elements over time. So it shows here right brain, female, earth, dark, cold, soft, negative pole. Left brain, male, heaven, light, hot, hard, positive pole. And then on here, continuing on with the right brain, feeling emotional, intuitive. So I'm going to read from right brain. Let's start over. Right brain is female, earth, dark, cold, soft, negative pole, feeling, emotional, intuitive, creative, holistic, unity, reserved, idealistic, passivity, parasympathetic nervous system. Left male brain is male, heaven, light, hot, hard, positive pole, thinking, logical, analytical, practical, sequential, duality, expressive, realistic, activity, sympathetic nervous system. So the first division of yin-yang separates the top and bottom of the face around the ages of 41 to 43 at the bridge of the nose. Faces are considered top heavy or bottom heavy, depending on the strength of the features of the features overall above the line or below it. So above or below it. And Dr. David talks about how he measures from the top of the brow to the top of the head, uh, as opposed to the top of the brow to the hairline. So it should be from whether from here to the top of your head, as opposed to here and the line below it. So people whose features are strongest above the line are considered to be luckier in younger life and people whose features are stronger below have better times that are coming. But in reading the face, the yin yang of the upper and lower face involves a foretelling of times in life that are more weighted in your favor depending on the combined strength of the features in that region. A good example is Elvis Presley. So Elvis Presley, whose face was heavily weighted on the top with a strong forehead, strong eyebrows and memorable eyes. His success and fame came young as he was extremely talented, although there was certainly luck involved in his discovery. Although his mouth was quite attractive, it was soft and there was very little strength in the bottom of his nose, his chin or his jaw. He unfortunately died at the age of 42, most likely because he believed he was going to die as his mother had died at that age as well. Her face was very much like this, although not as lucky. He also appeared to have used up a lot of his Jing with his intense lifestyle, which no doubt contributed to his tragic early death. This does not mean that if you have a top heavy face, you will die young. And it does not mean that all of your best years are behind you. It simply means that you have to prepare for the coming harder times to make your own luck because things won't come quite as easily as they once did. For people who have a bottom heavy face, 
they usually have it harder when younger with fewer breaks and life was often a struggle, but hard work does get rewarded eventually and that it develops character and there is ultimately a payoff. Bottom heavy people do tend to live longer, but that is most likely due to the tremendous will, strong chin, if I have a pointy chin, that they possess or have developed from getting through the hard times. Yeah, so I'm like bottom heavy, I'm not as top heavy. Interesting. And as I read this, I think of people who I know, it's like, wow, they're so top heavy as opposed to more bottom, bottom heavy. So the yin and the yang of the face top to bottom, the more well-known yin and yang split divides the face in half to create the right and the left sides. This yin yang of the face occur because of the de desire to have a public mask and to maintain a private persona. So what you show to the world is not always how you really feel. This creates an internal external polarity. If you look at, ev at anyone's face very carefully, you can see many subtle differences on the two sides of the face. Learning how to read the two sides gives you access into someone's true nature as opposed to the projections shown to the world. So you can see here, we've talked about like the, uh, in the previous picture, we saw the person, how that right eye was far more reserved, whereas the public eye was very crisp and clear. So it talks here about the private side, your public side. Yeah, and this is the analytical side, creative side, yin, yang. Yeah. So the easiest way to evaluate the two sides of the face is with a photograph. Take a photograph, divide it in half, and look first at one side and then the other. Look carefully for subtle differences in the shape and size of the features and the amount of depth of the lines. You will see a great deal once you start looking. Better yet, scan the photograph and create, create on a computer a composite of the two right sides of the face versus the two left sides of the face, what you get are two different looking people. You end up with what looks like a strange set of twins. The two right sides almost always look a little more placid or calm, whereas the two left sides usually show more, many more markings and shadows. Yeah, Jonathan has an app where he takes your picture and then he can get a mirror reflection of the left and to the right. He did on mine and I remember thinking it's like oh wow they kind of look very similar actually and, and I don't know if I can still pull mine up I wasn't planning on let's see that was um, I thought he sent it I know he sent it to me. The thing is whether I saved it in here or if I have it saved. I think I might have it saved. Maybe someplace else. Maybe I have it saved. But I don't see it here right now. Darn it. Yeah, it's kind of a cool, I'm going to have to ask him what app he used. Yeah, and this is a September class as opposed to. There was one that somebody had said in class that it would split your sides of your face basically in the middle and make them so they were left side, right side, or in a way paired together. Yeah. Um... Let me see maybe in WhatsApp images, because I'm, I'm trying to think if you send it to me in WhatsApp images. Let me see, I'm going to do a quick scan here if I could find. No. While you're looking for that, let me go check my printer. Oh, you're going to, that's a good idea. I'm going to see if I can turn my, oh, doggity dog. Hmm. I'm surprised. 
I don't see. Let me see if I can. Um... Yep, print it out. You did print it out. Let me see if I can print it out too. Print this. This is, I should be able to just print. Did you get yours to print? Yeah, I'm printing it right now. So it's okay. Yeah, because this is what mine looked like printing it out. Hold on a second. Page 122. Yeah, yours going to look the same. So let me show me how yours um, shows up. Okay. Your sh it's all red? The red? No. It shouldn't be. Your whole, um, all I see is red on your. Well, I don't. See. Well, yeah, why? Is, I see this red thing. Why is it red? Uh, you must have had something red that's covering your camera. No, camera's right there. But yeah, I just see a big red square yeah. all of a sudden on me. Most of the time, I disappear. Huh. That's weird. That is, uh, yeah, mine printed. Um, so, huh. I don't know why. And yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, because half the time, I don't see me at all. I just see you. Well, when it comes to the... Um, Full screen, I see your screen, and then I, but I still see you. Yeah, I don't know why yours is flashing from red to you to red to you. I don't, um, I don't know about that. Okay, so if we want to go through each one of... I'm going to throw this out. So, okay, so we'll go through the water element. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, I have a lot of water.
So I'm on the earth element now. How about you? Um, I just started to go back through it again. So I guess we have to count them up. Gads, am I going down here? I'm checking, checking, checking on the fire. Goodness. Interesting. So I'm one, two, three. So my <laughs> my fire and my metal are I got fourteen of those traits for both fire and metal but I'm over 21, 21 water, nine wood, 14 fire, 14 metal, and six earth. So I'm primarily water one, and then fire and metal is tied. That's my two and three. How about you? Well, let me count them up. Let's see, one, three, four, five, six, seven, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Wow, seven water, ten wood, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 15 fire, one, two, three, four, five, six, earth, one, two, three, three metal. So now according to this, I'm fire, then I'm wood, then water, then earth, then hardly any metal. Hardly any metal. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, I added one thing to metal because I saw polished. I'm like, oh, how did I miss that? So I added polish to that. So I'm number one water. I had 21 of those characteristics. I have 15 of the metal. That would be my second. My third would be fire. I have 14. And then my fourth ranking one would be wood. I have nine of those elements. And the least I have of is earth, which is six. Hmm. Interesting, huh? Yeah, that is. I think it would be a really cool tool, yeah, to use with our private clients as we're doing private one-on-ones. Even even if you're doing groups, uh, I'm starting to do uh, some like group Zoom sessions with people with groups, and uh, I think this would be also a fun thing to kind of go through. It's kind of a nice little, you know, profile. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, five element personality quiz. Okay. So, okay, so let's move on here to, we'll continue here on page 124. It's 912, so I think we can go another um, 15 minutes. We'll see how far we get into this chapter. Okay. As we started at seven. So, and is the sound okay on your end? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So the first division of yin and yang separates the top and bottom of the face around the ages of 41 to 43 or at the bridge of the nose. Faces are considered, did I read this part already? No, I don't remember. Okay, so. I think, I think yeah, you did a little bit, but I don't remember where, yeah, because we got to Presley. So. I think we did. Yes, you're right, we did. We did get to Presley. Yeah, we were on the next page. The hard times. Because we hadn't got that far yet, yeah, because you were doing the, the two sides. Yeah. So we got the yin and yang of the face, top and bottom. We're here on page 126. The more yeah. yin and yang split divides the face in half to create the right side, the left sides, this yin and yang, which we see here at 3-3. Three, three. This yin yang of the face occur between the desire to have a public mask. Yeah, we read this part. Right. What you show to the world is not always how you really feel, and this creates an internal external polarity. If you look at anyone's face very carefully, you will see very subtle differences on the two sides of the face. Learning how to read the two sides gives you access into someone's true nature as opposed to the projection shown to the world. That was the last thing I read before we actually did this test. Now, when you look here, the yin and yang of the face two sides. The easiest way to evaluate the two sides of the face is with a photograph. Yeah, that's right, we read, we read this. So if we move on to the following page, then we actually see how this girl, who on the side, you can see how this eyebrow is slightly more pointed than her right side. And so here you have the symmetry of the more pointed brows here, but see how this looks a little more masculine and this looks more feminine and how her face is more oval shaped here and here it's more, a little more, here it's oval and here it's a little more oblong squarish. Yeah. And here like, it's, look at the neck on her too. Yeah, see how wide her neck is here and here it's more narrow. And those three women look so close. I was trying to decide if they were the same woman. But she looks more like, if you look at her here, this is closer to this than here to here. It's, oh, it is the same woman. It is, yeah, these three are the same person. It's just that this is her right side mirrored this is her left side mirrored. Oh, okay. So when you take her face in half and you take the right side and mirror it, this is what you get, which is closer to what she actually looks like. That looks like it could be her twin sister. Mm -hmm. Whereas this doesn't really look like her. This is her right side of her face mirrored. See here how it's inverted? Here she has a widow's peak. See how much wider her neck is and her face is a lot more square. So her personal side overall is shining through more, even though this is her public side. Mm -hmm. Really what she embodies holistically as in completely and the face that she presents to the world is more representative from her private side, not her public side. Because she doesn't look, there's not as much similarity. Her eyes are the same, but that's about it. Her mouth is much different. These mouths are almost identical. These nose, that nose is almost identical to this. Look at how different her nose looks from here to here. Mm -hmm. Look at how different, I mean, that's basically this eyebrow doubled. This eyebrow doubled is this. This, there's more semblance to her, and it's more feminine as opposed to this side. Yeah. 
fascinating. So this woman has several major, major differences on her face when her face is split in half. Her mouth is much wider on the right and her brow, eyebrows are more arched. Her face is also much broader and her chin is more square, which, is, which this means is that she is much more introverted, easygoing, less decisive, and less stubborn than she appears. So it's saying here that she's much more introverted, easygoing, less decisive, and less stubborn than she appears. Her right side makes her seem like she's more decisive. Yeah, she's actually more, more introverted, but it's, I would say in her private side, she's more easygoing. On her public side, she's more decisive. Yeah. Now look at this guy over here on the right. This guy, wow, he has a lot of inflammation. Poor guy. His lungs, ooh, and he's got a lot of back inflammation, a lot of lung inflammation. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Um, and probably yeah, he's got some things, I think, going on with his, with his um, intestines, too, because his lip, lips are kind of a dark red. But it says, this man has a much broader face on the right. His chin is narrower and his nose is shorter on the right. See how this nose, you know, it kind of comes down here, but when you double it, it's short. On the left here, it's more like matches more of this. His left side shows that he is less social, more stubborn, more pragmatic, and more ambitious than he appears. He also shows more grief. Look at how pronounced his grief is. It's more pronounced on his public side than his personal side. Yeah, more pronounced grief on the left. On his personal side, he doesn't show as much grief. So what do the differences mean? How did the two sides of the face become different? Yeah, look at how much more open he is on the private side. Let's see how his eye comes down on the public side. So he's far more guarded, more critical, more guarded, less apt to show. Like see his lower lid is showing a little on the private side. On the public side, it's completely covered. So I gotta move this. So the Chinese say, the Chinese have studied this phenomenon for centuries and they consider the right side of the face to be the yin side. This is the individual's true right side and is seen by others from their left. This yin is passive and therefore the less emotional side. This is the side that is shown to the world and it is the public mask. Your left side is the more active side and it shows more inner emotions. So it's saying that our left side is more active and it shows more of your inner emotions, but these have not been expressed publicly. This is the side that holds onto everything repressed. Yeah, so it's your, yeah, your, your, this side is your private and this is your public. So Western scientists have also studied this phenomena of facial symmetry and have discovered that it can be linked to split brain function. Both sides of the brain are equally important and neither side is better than the other. The left side of the brain is primarily logical, factual, detail-oriented, and analytical. The side of the brain corresponds to the opposite side of the body. For example, when a stroke occurs in the left hemisphere of the brain, it paralyzes the right side of the body. When you are thinking and using the left side of your brain, the corresponding right side of the face makes few expressions and therefore marks less over time. Hmm. The right side, yeah, Jill, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, she's a neuroscientist that studied, actually she studied stroke victims and then interestingly enough, she had a stroke herself, took her like 10 years to recover and then she ended up writing a book called The Stroke of Insight. I don't know if you've heard or read about her. Uh -oh. I actually quoted her in my book um, in the Intuition Manifesto because she talks about the right brain function as opposed to the left side function. And, you know, we're talking about how the left side of the brain is, you know, the critical analytical 
um, thinking structures, memory, you know, putting away memory. Anytime you have an experience, you categorize and file away memory using your left side of your brain. The right side of the brain is all more intuitive, the creative side, um, spatial recognition, um, 3D perceptions, um, intuitive, um, the intuitive faculties, also um, uh, like creative downloads and so forth. That all comes from the right side. And it's also when you have the left brain affected, your right side is what allows you to be one with the one when, when you are, if you don't have left brain function, which in her case, her stroke affected her left side brain. So immediately as her left brain was disconnected from her right brain and she no longer had use because of the hemorrhage that was taking place, then she had no perception of the difference between herself in her body as a conscious being. There is no difference between her and the walls and the objects around her. She was one with everything that was around her. And she saw her hands go, go like her visual perception saw her hands morph from hands into claws, into energy. It was fascinating. Oh. So I, um, I quote different, you know, some things from her book and my Impression Manifesto book because it's, it's uh, just fascinating, some of the things that she reveals. It, for me, it made me make sense of why certain things happen when you're doing either, either hypnosis, meditation, or hypnosis and meditation combined, which I think there's a very fine line between the two. They're really kind of one and the same. Yeah, that's and, be, they're one and the same. Yeah, they're really, they're basically meditation the Meditation has a better um, name, more accepting. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're inextricably, uh, you cannot separate one from the other truly. But one of the things that I've never, you know, that I started doing in my own practice, I did it intuitively. And then when I read about her work and learned more about um, what her insights were, then I intuitively knew to guide the, my conscious awareness to the right side of my brain because I wanted more blood flow to go to the right side of the brain as opposed to the left side of the brain because I wanted to expand not only my conscious awareness, but I also wanted to increase the mystical experiences and I wanted to be able to manifest more things. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the things that I do in whether it's meditation, hypnosis, or both, I always direct my energy as I bring up my attention from my, the base of my spine going up my spine all the way up to my right brain. I direct more energy to my right side of the brain as opposed to the left because in meditation, what you want to do is you want to silence the monkey brain. You know, you have your prefrontal cortex, you have the limbic brain, you have the monkey brain, and then you have the reptilian brain, which is activated during fight or flight and so what you want to stop is the monkey brain chitter chatter you want to stop the ego you want to stop any memory you want to shut the brain's thinking and then just be the conscious awareness so that you can then connect one with the one so that then you can mold the clay in 5d whether you're using the energy to heal or to, you're manifesting something manifesting healing manifesting, creating something or changing an unwanted into a wanted circumstance. But you have to silence the left brain in order to do that. You have to command it to be quiet. And it just happens more quickly and easier if you just bring more energy to the right side of the brain because there's more blood flow there. But nobody tells you that. So like on Love and Money Secrets TV, that's one of the things that I tell people to do is like direct the energy. And I tell them why and how, how to distinguish. Cause you have, that's part of, part of the process of learning all this stuff is learning to not just silence the mind or silence the brain, but learning how to distinguish your thoughts versus your conscious awareness, your brain as an organ, your ego, your body, which you think is you, but it's not you. And then your conscious awareness, which is, always loving it never has anything critical nothing judgmental you're it's it's always a loving expression a loving thought you're you never fall short you never are it's never expressing that you're not enough or anything it's always it's all knowing so um but you know it took me over 25 years to have you know to yeah probably 20 something years to come to that realization 
and then put the pieces of the puzzle together along with medical scientific background, you know, evidence, so that it's not just from experience, but now it's documented scientifically. So I think I quoted, um, yeah, there's, um, I think some different researchers that I quote, because I know Kendall talks about um, the neurological pathways of the brain and how you fire and wire. Anyhow, I don't want to get too technical into that right now, but moving on. So the right side of the brain is primarily creative, holistic, intuitive, and emotional. It synthesizes the details of the left side of the brain, of the brain picks up. The right side of the brain feels the emotions and sends them to the left side to, of the face to be expressed. So Dr. Daniel J. Siegel in this book, The Developing Mind, described it like this, the capacities to sense another's emotions, to understand others' minds, and even to express one's emotions via facial expressions and tone of voice are all mediated primarily by the right side of the brain. The right brain is obviously very important to face reading. And pause button here, I would say not only to face reading, but also for you to connect to it, at least for me, for, and when you, you know how Dr. David talks about how we did that exercise where we connected to um, another person's autonomic nervous system? It's um, yeah. in the regression technologies class that we took. Oh, you took it. You didn't take, oh, that's right. You weren't there in the, in the regression technologies class. So yeah. he does this exercise where you stand side by side by another person and you are on purpose paying attention to the shift in your body, you'll actually feel it as you're standing, you will feel a shift in your body. And then you know that you've connected to another person's autonomic nervous system. Now you can do that with somebody standing next to you, somebody standing in the same room with you, or you can do it remotely where somebody could be, I've done it with people, you know, I'm here and they're in Ireland. I'm here, they're in Costa Rica, they're in Japan, they're in Italy, they're not even in my own country. So you can do that and you'll actually feel a shift in your body. You're like, okay, now you're connected. So now like yourself, you're a Reiki energy healer. So you can now direct the energy to heal and tap into their autonomic nervous system to heal whatever it is in their body. Being that your body doesn't have that condition, you're connecting to their autonomic nervous system, helps them and train to your state of well being, And now you're adding an extra dose of energy and their brain is entrained with your brain, so their autonomic nervous system receives the command to send a signal of, you know, there's up to 140,000 chemicals that are produced by the brain to signal your, there's like 23,688 DNA throughout the human body. So it will either upregulate or downregulate whatever is necessary to now optimize the body so it's free of whatever illness, disease, or whatever it is that's um, causing them pain and suffering, whatever their medical condition is. Mm. The right brain, you can increase that where it even happens faster if you just direct the blood flow. Just thinking about it, setting the intention. It's like, okay, I'm just going to bring the energy up. As I breathe, I'm going to bring it up and have it go to the right side. And then you feel the shift. And then you just keep moving. So... Okay, so moving on here, the right brain is obviously very important to face reading. So if an emotion is meant to be publicly expressed, it will start expressing on the left side and then go to the right side of the face within milliseconds. If there is any blockage to expressing, the emotion is pushed down and inhibited. If this repression is a frequent occurrence, the left side becomes more heavily marked over time interesting so it'll actually so the more the emotion is pushed down and inhibited if the repression is a frequent occurrence the left side will become more marked over time so ideally both sides of this face should be symmetrical as symmetrical as possible for optimal health people with two sides that are very similar show how they feel when they feel it. 
They don't hide what they feel, and what you see is what you get. However, the desire to hide our true nature or our deeper emotions keep us out of a yin-yang alignment. Both sides of the brain should be used because they are both necessary for full functioning. So in the Western world, we are encouraged and even trained to become left brain dominant. These traits are simply more valued business focus on left brain thinking with the focus on the details, the bottom line, organization and efficiency. Children are encouraged to become more and more left brain as our schools focus on reading, writing and arithmetic. If school districts have to cut their budgets, they usually eliminate art, music, physical education and all right brain balancing activities. Luckily, our society is starting to rediscover the value of, I gotta move this because I can't read this in the way, of right brain functions. A whole movement has started to help people become more right brain. For example, doctors have discovered becoming ambidextrous is advantageous to individu individuals after stroke. The ambidextrous patient will not be nearly as incapacitated and recovery occurs quicker. Psychologists have started recommending that people use their non-dominant hands and eyes to achieve brain balance. I'm going to pause right here because as you and I, uh, you know, we took identity by design and we had um, those different, the multiple certifications that we got in August. Um, you know, when we're doing the neurosomatic processes, the fact that we're using our left and our right hands, we're engaging our left and our right brain as like, for example, when you do the spinning technique or you do the frame uh, technique, mm -hmm. you're using your left, anytime you're using your left and your right hand or your left and your right foot, left and your right eyes, that is engaging left and right hemispheres of the brain. So that's making the energy cross over on both sides um, because your right brain, you know, controls the left side of your body and your left brain controls the right side of your body. So you're automatically rewiring and firing. And that's why that neurosomatic, aside from it using the eight different nomadic, uh, neurosomatic processes of the body, but you're doing, um, you're actually doing neurochemistry. There's a whole energy that's moving because of the neurochemistry that's taking place when you do that process. Mm. Yeah. I've been meaning to look up this guy, Dr. Daniel Siegel, The Developing Mind. I need to pick up his book, and I'd like to see if I can have him on my show because I think that would be fascinating. Okay, so another fascinating and related fact about the brain function is that men and women use their brains in very different ways. Okay, so men tend to use one side of the brain at a time, whereas women tend to use women more frequently access both sides of the brain at the same time. I'm going to hit the pause button here because doc, um, there's John Gray from Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. He has a lot of research that he quotes all the time from UCLA Medical School as well as Stanford Research Institute. And it talks about when they put up encephalographs, EEGs, and they hook up men and women with these EEGs and they start to do brain scans and they have men and women both do certain exercises you will see that a woman's brain, if you divide the brain up into seven regions, all seven regions of a woman's brain is wiring and firing at the exact same time. The emotional center, the limbic system, the monkey brain, the reptilian brain, all, the left, right parietal side, all of it is firing and wiring at the same time. In a man's brain, he'll only have the frontal cord, if it's something emotional, because the front part of the brain has to do with your emotional centers, it'll only be the emotional centers of the brain. If it has to do with them having to figure out some sort of mathematical function, it'll only be the left limbic brain. He won't have the front and the reptilian brain. He'll only have the side that's associated with the left side of the brain that he needs for calculating whatever that problem is. Whereas a woman's brain, all seven sides are, are firing and wiring at the same time. So when, which is, it explains like once you understand this, how a male brain works from a female brain, when a woman is in an argument, discussion, any kind of a challenge with a man, and she's asking a guy how he feels in the middle of this conflict or problem or obstacle, 
he does, he can't, it's physiologically impossible for him to say and to articulate what he's feeling because he's not using the verbal center of his brain. He's using his left side, critical thinking side of the brain. This part is shut off and the reptilian brain is sh shut off. He, he can only have one side firing at a time, mm. which is also why men never get overwhelmed. It's physiologically impossible because as soon as something is too much, they automatically shut down. They go into their cave. By going into the cave, they not only re rest and restore, but they also bring back their testosterone level so that now they can come back and tackle whatever problem that needs to be tackled because they've restored their testosterone. And now they have the drive and the fuel to tackle whatever problem. Whereas women, they get overwhelmed because they're using all seven parts of the brain while they're in the middle of an argument, they can spatially tell how far a kid is and if he's going to fall off the sofa and maybe break his neck. At the same time, they can articulate that they're getting pissed off at their spouse because he forgot to bring a gallon of milk when she told him by text and voicemail to bring the milk home. And now, you know, she's got to tell him for the third time. And she's like, Johnny, you know, she's rescuing this kid from falling and breaking his neck. She's, she's able to express that she's angry. And she's able to recall at the same time. That's only, it's because her brain is wired to all of it. It's lighting up like a Christmas tree. So she can access all parts simultaneously. That's why she can multitask and a man cannot. That's also why women get overwhelmed. They, they're spinning too many plates because of that. And men don't. And, and it's like unfair because women assume we can't imagine you not being able, you know, we are thinking that our brains are the same, that we're, you know, we're both human beings. Well, yeah, we are the same, but just because we're the same, we're not identical to each other. We are wired differently. Just as I have different body parts from a man and vice versa, our brains, although we have the same brain organ structure it functions differently just as a man's body functions a little differently from a female's but we're not if we were taught this from elementary school through high school then i think there would be more compassion on both sides because we'd realize I'm like okay i don't i'm not operating with the same tools like you have to appreciate that's why men and women need each other it's like okay i need you because you have the capacity to do this and vice versa but this is like it's almost like this hidden secret that until it's only been in the last 20 25 years that this research has been done that's now been you know slowly coming to light and john gray has been bringing this out for the last started like 40 years ago but really the heavy research started coming out about 20 25 years ago and he has like 28 books that he's um uh, written on this, the one that I'm reading right now is called Beyond Mars and Venus. Great book. You might want to pick it up. Wow. It talks about this and how men and women individually and with your partner, you can do things to behave your way into getting your hormones and neurochemistry in sync without you having to take uh, external, you know, supplements like, uh, you know, whether it's estrogen, oxytocin, progesterone, testosterone, you can behave your way into increasing that. And, but you have to know what the behaviors are to balance yourself. And at the same time, it optimizes your health. And it, when you're in union with another partner, uh, you know, a, a man with a woman and vice versa, then both of you are optimized so that you are in a healthy state Physically, emotionally, psychologically, relationally, etc. So it's fascinating. Yeah. So this is a result of the increased number of connections in the corpus callosum of a woman's brain, a part of the brain scientists have also found to be enlarged in women, which is why we have bigger emotional responses than men. Um, Dr. Bennett Shaywitz of Yale, this is not highlighting right. Yeah, it's not right. Anyhow, Dr. 
Bennett A. Shewitz of Yale University School of Medicine found women process verbal language on both sides of their brain, whereas men process it on the left side only. That's what I was talking about just a minute ago. This may explain why women's faces get more lined than men's faces. They can think and feel simultaneously and do so more often. Markings and lines are heavier and deeper on the left side of the face in individuals who repress the <coughs> expression of their emotions. This, like left brain thinking, is encouraged in our society. Yet, most people look only at our passive right mask and rarely even notice the left side of the face. Because more than 80% of the population is right-handed, the majority are also right eye dominant. Because the eyes focus in toward a single point, most people use their dominant right eye to pick up the information on another person's face. Because our brains are lazy, we assume the face is double right side composite. People, don't, people just don't look at the left side very often unless they're left eye dominant. I believe these people are getting a much better read on people because they are getting so much more information and are able to synthesize it. You can test your eyes to find out which one is dominant by paying attention to which eye you use when you focus a camera or a pair of binoculars. You can also roll up a piece of paper like spyglass and put it up to your eye. Which one did you choose? That's your dominant eye. Yeah, I, I, um, years ago I learned about the right, you know, the right being the public and the left being the private. And so I've always made a point to look at somebody's uh, left eye because I want to connect to their private side. You know, because I'm trying to, you know, in the past it was when I had a mortgage bank, it was because I want to be able to make you comfortable and understand you on a more personal level because here you're supposed to open up your finances um, to me, you know, because you're usually buying the largest asset that you'll ever buy is usually your home or you're spending, you know, the largest amount of money you'll spend is usually buying, you know, real estate, whether it's residential or commercial. So your money is something that's so intimate and so something that usually other other than your accountant you know your cpa maybe yep. your financial advisor or stockbroker you don't talk to anybody else about other than possibly your spouse and more superficially with your buddies but you don't talk about the actual you know dollars and cents that you have so i always made it a point to to connect with um with people with their private side by looking at their left side left eye always and i would glance at their right eye but focus primarily on their left eye. And it worked. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. So if you want to get to know someone better, use your left eye, which taps into your right brain to look at the left side of a person's face and compare it with the right side. You will be amazed at what you see. What exactly do all the differences mean? Any feature that occurs on both sides of the face can be evaluated. The easiest and most obvious feature to evaluate is the eyes. Most people look at the eyes first. Anyway, the overall size and shape of both eyes is evaluated first. Then the reader determines which one is smaller and which one is larger. Eyes are measured in terms of vertical height. How open they are indicates how big they are. And let me move this over. And eyes correspond to the heart. If the heart is open, the eyes will be open. This is interesting because remember, Dr. David told us in the, the face reading that one of the corollaries to you being a good match with another person is if you both have the approximate same size eyes, same size nose, same size mouth, the more your eyes are um, matching with another person, the better chance that there will be a good, that there will be a good match for you. If you know, somebody has really little eyes and the other person has really big eyes, it's probably not going to be a very good match. But this is interesting about eyes correspond to the heart. <laughs> Wish I would have known that before. <laughs> if, the, if the heart is shut down or the brain is more active, the eyes will be narrowed. See chapter six. People who have been badly hurt in the past often have eyes that are held so tightly narrowed, they look as if they're squinting. <laughs> These individuals watch everyone carefully 
and have major trust issues. People with large eyes are emotional, expressive, and receptive. Emotions are easily revealed because they are easier to see. And these people are more receptive because they take in more emotional information. If you were to open your eyes very wide while around other people, you would immediately feel very exposed and vulnerable. You are taking everything in. It feels safer to narrow. Narrow them slightly and watch. Big-eyed people tend to be warmer and more trusting, sometimes too much so, and this can make them vulnerable. Makes sense because you know you've heard the expression of somebody who's doe-eyed, they have like the big doe-eyed, you know, look. Which has kind of an inherent um, sense of innocence at the same time. So eyes that are perpetually held narrow can cause health difficulties. The straight is often tied to heart disease where an emotional opening of the heart needs to occur for healing. Constant narrow, narrowed eyes indicate people who are analytical and perceiving. People who like to think. Spend a minute trying to solve a math problem and you will notice you automatically narrow your eyes. Thinking constantly without emotion makes your eyes smaller. Mm. Hmm. Eyes are shaped by the constant use of eyelids. A person may be born with large eyes and hold them narrow because of life experiences. A person with small eyes can hold them open to express and receive as much emotion as possible. What you do with your eyes matters more than what you started with. Because the eyelids are under our control, the best advice is to narrow your eyes when you need to watch and think and open them when you need to feel or receive. Don't get stuck living just one way. Evaluate people by determining whether they are holding their eyes open or narrowed. This is the baseline for receptivity and emotional expression. I'm sure we've all heard the expression, you know, the eyes are the window to the soul. Yeah. It's, it's true. It's letting you know what they're, you know, if somebody's critic, you know, really, that means that they're really critically thinking, really, you know, being more um, discriminant as opposed to somebody who's more open-eyed. So next, look to see which eye is larger than the other. A person whose right eye is bigger than the left eye appears to the outside world to be open, emotional, and receptive. But in reality, on inside, the person is really analytical, perceiving, or watchful. An individual whose left eye is larger than the right eye is showing the analytical thinker to the world or trying to appear savvy or shrewd. In reality, this <coughs> is a softy who is receptive, emotional, and expressive in private. This is slightly more common in business people where it pays to look like a thinker and to hide the feeler. Okay, pause button here. So I want you to take a look. We're going to do a stop screen share of the book here. We are on page, we're on page 132. I'm going to stop share of here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to YouTube and I am going to find... Jeff Bezos of Amazon. Let's take, this is a perfect one right here. <laughs> this is going to trip you. Think that eating this is going to trip you out. Because when I first noticed this, I thought, oh my gosh, what the heck? Okay, so check this out. I, I muted the sound because we really don't need to, doesn't matter what he's saying, we're just gonna look at his face. Now look, you're gonna do a, a close up of him and then I'll freeze it. There, you can't tell as much. 
Right. Lots of joy lines, but some sadness in there. They'll do a frontal shot of him in a minute. But you'll see that there's a marked difference between his right eye and his left eye. They're going to do, a, we call it an aret. It's like a real focus, a real close-up focus of his face. And you'll see when he's a little bit more neutral face, and you'll see how one eye is significantly bigger than the other. Let's see if I can fast forward. He's turned his head back and forth too quick. Yeah, though, I think there's another camera angle, but we'll see. Did you already watch this video? Not this one in particular, but I noticed it on multiple videos that I saw of him talking before, and I thought, wow, like, you know, just in a still shot, it was a marked difference, his left from his right eye. It was so telling to read his face. So I thought, oh my goodness. And he has fairly big eyes too, as you notice. There you can kind of get a little bit of a semblance there, but notice how this is so much more cut off. This is far more open. Do you notice that? Yeah. See if there's another angle that might be a little bit better, a little farther. You can see all the the bottom of the pupil on the left eye. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that would be right there. Same thing again. His right eye is actually bigger than his left eye. Yeah, pupil and everything. Yep. More white shows. Yep, there's more reservation on his left. Nope. Yeah, let me see if I can find, um, there's a, let me see if I can. Kind of see here, see how it's so much smaller, the right from the left. Here it's pretty pronounced. See how it's so much smaller? That's the one that we were just looking at. Mm -hmm. look, at look at how his face has changed from then to now. He was more reserved on his private side, more open on his public. It's kind of reversed. Here, here, look at how much more pronounced it is here. Your cursor's not moving. Uh, the cursor's not moving? No, it's just pointed at its collar. Um, are you able to, it says sharing is paused. Are you able to see the, are you seeing the YouTube right now? No, I'm just, well, it's showing him that he's, he's paused with his hand up. Oh, okay. So it's. Can you see this? It says sharing is pause. I kind of do stop share. Let me do screen share again. But see how, I wonder how they're like, if sometimes they're reversing the image that's what it looks like because in every one of those left eye bigger left eye bigger except for that one that you just went up but it yeah. was the left eye on the right side yeah yep yeah one with the green woman you can tell it no they reversed that image yeah that's the one thing it's like See if you can see um, more of them down here, but you can see how there's such a marked difference between the left and the right eye. Yes. See how much rounder, and then mm -hmm. you have 
the overlapping you don't have the overlapping here but on the on the public side you have it on this private side it's it's um you know cleaner you can see the lower eyelid here the lower eyelid is closed so he's obviously guarding when it comes to the public yeah let me see if there's another one where you could see but i just thought what i when i first saw that that was see how here it's so pronounced too how it's so much more closed it's private even though the eyelid the eyelid is smaller, but you can see the eyelid. The eyelid does not cover, the upper eyelid does not cover the lower eyelid. In this picture, this um, private side is a lot more closed than his public side. I think that's reversed again. I think so too. Yeah. Because you look at all of them and the majority of them, it's left eye bigger. Yeah. Yeah, so I think this is a reverse image. Yeah, it's amazing that we can even tell that the image is reversed because of, yeah, that's what it is. That is a reversed image. Yeah, here you can see that's normally. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, though. Don't you think? Yeah. Okay, it's um, almost 10, so I think it's probably a good place for us to stop there with having taken a look at Jeff Bezos' face. <laughs> okay, thanks again, Lillian. You're quite Enjoy welcome, it. and hope you had a good time going over this material. I did. I'll pick up from where we left off, and then I'll um, post this so that uh, in our group that you guys can take a look at it for whoever wants to rewatch it and um, that's kind of basically it. So, all right. Okay, Pam said, tell you hi. She yeah, texted I was, a while I was hoping that maybe she was gonna jump, jump on towards, you know, the latter part of the, of the class because I know, she, you know she's busy working and so forth. I thought, oh, maybe she'll get off on time where she'll be able to jump on. I probably should have told her to. Yeah, I figure she will if she can, and if she can, it just depends on. And she's, I'm sure she's tired and she's done working all day and then having to jump on here. Yeah, today was the work all day, then go bowling, then go cleaning. Wow. Active, active, active. Well, that's good. All right, it sounds great. Well, you have a great rest of the evening, and then, um, like I said, I'll be, I'll put the link in the, uh, in our group, and uh, we'll kind of go from there. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks,